Let's say plenary session. Uh, the second part of our plenary session, I expect that you have interesting discussions, share the interesting ideas, maybe even have found a next platform for project. Am I right? Okay, we still have time. During the second part, we will, uh, we will listen to three interesting presentations. The first one will be about transnational cooperation and Laura Marin is already here. Just yesterday night arrived from the Stockholm. She's program coordinator for joint program initiative. Laura, I invite you already to take the place on the table. The second speaker will be Robert Shatok, and Robert will tell us how look immunization in the future. Am I right? Who is it, Robert? Yeah, okay. Robert, may I invite you? Very exciting topic, and Robert represents professor of the mucosal infection and immunology in Imperial in London. And the last but not least speaker will be Iona Ispas. Yeah, Iona. And Iona will, will have a broad presentation about past, present, and even future of Romanian infection disease research. But as I promised, Laura is already here. The first slide is ready, and we're waiting for your presentation. Thank you. So, hello to everyone. So, I hope you're fresh after the coffee. So, I first would like to, to very much thank you, the Latvian colleagues, for the invitation and, and to be here today in this event. So, what we're going to talk about is a bit the Jump Project Initiative on Antimicrobial Resistance, and I don't think in this audience I really need to explain what is about what is antimicrobial resistance. As you know, especially in the last year, there's an increasing greater concern in society regarding the resistance that is being developed on antibiotic, and this is creating a stress in our health systems and is creating also economic costs, etc., etc., and therefore is going beyond of a medical and a public health threat, but also it has an important research angle of there's nothing really going on on the pipeline. We got the presentation this morning of what IMA is doing in, in this respect, but the full map on research in this field is really skewed and, and um, yeah, not very harmonized or strategic thinking. And that was, was about 2012 that this initiative by different European member states was launched in order to create a platform where the national resources regarding research, infrastructure, etc., could be, be jointly or coordinated or harmonized in order to tackle this um, health threat that is antibiotic resistance. So how it's been doing that is by developing a common vision and a common strategy on how we can uh, increase the critical mass of research in this field. At the moment, there's like 21 countries which are part of this initiative. Uh, apart from Europe, we also have uh, Canada or Argentina also members of it. And as you can see, Latvia is not a member, yeah. but, but. The good news are that Lavia is going to join in our next year joint call. So it's very nice that even Lavia at the moment is not a, a formal <coughs> partner of the initiative. The first step is to um, also participate in our joint call next year through an ERANET COFAN exercise. But I will tell you a bit more about it. So, so what has been the, the, the starting point is saying, okay, what can we actually do that not what the WHO is doing or what the health ministries are doing, what can we do ex more specific regarding research in order to tackle antibiotic resistance, especially more on the basic science side, that is what traditionally the European countries are funding bottom up and what can we do about it? So the idea was in 2013 was the developing of a strategic research agenda who will guide what should be the joint actions that we can do together on the funding side and also on other um, instruments to mobilize research. <coughs> and um, here you can see 
the pillars of this strategic research agenda, and you can see it goes from therapeutics, discovery, drug development to diagnostics tools, surveillance, have we got also presentation of things that ECDC is doing on surveillance, but also on, on transmission and environment, which are more where we have at the moment less funding and, and more a knowledge gap, and on, on the intervention side. So this framework provides the plan on what can we allocate funding and what should be focused and prioritized activities from the research funders at national level point of view. And this is a bit more the detail of what is this, this agenda. And how it's been organized is like there's different boards. There's a management board where the representative from the different ministries takes part. And then we have um, scientific board, also national experts board at each country and the stakeholder board. And then we have a secretariat that is what I manage in Sweden, which is located at the Swiss Research Country, <coughs> sorry, at the Swiss Research Council, which coordinates all the efforts that are being developed. So, and I'm just going to what happened in 2014 after we did uh, a launch of this strategic research agenda with different countries also outside Europe to, in order to see the alignment of the different research agendas out there in the world. For example, with the Americans, they also have a research agenda on antimicrobial resistance and how we can see how we can align or with South Africa or India. So there's an effort on seeing uh, how everything is very much aligned and how we should all go in the same direction in order to get somewhere closer to tackle antibiotic resistance. And this all now on how are we implementing and how we are tackling these different areas. We started with some, some mappings because, of course, we, unfortunately, in Europe, we don't really know what we are funding, you see. So we did some planning to see what are we funding, <coughs> what are all the projects that we are funding in Europe regarding antibiotic resistance. So we get, at the moment, in Europe, about 1,500 projects running, research projects in Europe at the moment. And you can see that the funding is not very big in this area. And uh, as you can see from all the funding on competitive research in Europe, what is funded at national level is the same, for example, almost that what IMI is funded in this specific area. So it needs, it, it's a um, warning call to see that we need to dedicate more funds in this area. Because now, for example, if you compare with what we are funding in cancer research, for example, which is huge in comparison of what we are funding antibiotic resistance, but we will see that in 20 years, there's going to be more deaths due to antibiotic resistance than on cancer. So really, we need to do something about it. And that is what we are trying to tackle. And then at the moment, it's almost finalized. We're also doing a database of which SMEs we have at each national level in this, in this area, and which are the national strategies and the national policies and the national plans regarding antibiotic resistance. So we are developing all this database that should be finished next month. And regarding international relations, as you said, we, we work together with other countries, but especially with the World Health Organization, because as you know, this month the World Health Organization is going to agree of a new resolution and a new action plan on antimicrobial resistance, and there's going to be five points most of them regarding public health aspects, but there's going to be a specific point on research and on the development of a global research agenda on antimicrobial resistance. So we've been to several meetings with them, and basically they're going to take the basis of the strategic research agenda we have developed here in Europe to be the global one, and we're going to work together with them in this issue. And then we are doing um, some kind of strategic scoping workshops to try to identify what should be the research priorities and what could we do to, that is not being done, that there's gaps or there will be a value added to do something jointly. You know, for example, I just been in London yesterday because we did a workshop on diagnostics together with different academic experts and the industry to see why even though we are funding a lot, in the, especially in the last five, <coughs> two, five years, we are spending a lot of funding in, on diagnostic development, and, um, but there's not much change. It's not really bringing 
a product in the market. So we got this meeting to see which are the barriers, what are the bottlenecks, if it's on regulation, and what can we do. So for example, on the, I'm just getting now because I need to leave the workshop in order to come here and receive this morning the briefings on the ideas of what can we do in this field. Of, for example, the idea will be now to find a roadmap on what are the bottlenecks and why we don't have a diagnostics because other people like the commission, etc., is funding this year on diagnostics. And then we decided actually yesterday to have a transmission workshop in September also. So we are doing all this type of activities. And then what most people think that is most visible activity, which is the joint calls, of course. So we have yearly calls and we start last year in 2014 after the development of the strategic research agenda and as you can see was on on um, approaches on antimicrobial resistance and we had in this very moment a call open on neglected antibiotics and next year we will have a substantially much larger call on transmissions through uh, Iranet Kofan and we are also this fall going to decide the launch of several research networks in different areas which will tackle more uh, policy aspects like for example this one I said on the roadmap on diagnostics or also in order to help to develop networks on people who has data sets on bacteria etc. So this is the type we are, will find about 10 uh, research networks that will help us to develop some kind of think tanks and position papers or white papers on specific topics that we feel we need more knowledge on. And this is a bit, for example, last year, which type of projects we funded. As you can see, there's uh, something also on TV that I can see that was a topic this morning. And this is the call that we have at the moment open <coughs> on term antibiotic resistance. Last year, the call, what we do is a rotation in the management of the calls. So last year was Germany managing the call. This year is uh, France managing the call and the peer review process. So we have an alternative process among countries. And then that is the last thing I would like to, to share with you is about what are we doing beyond these joint activities and what we're doing back home in each several country, which is this magical word that everyone uses now, which is alignment, you know. So what is alignment meaning in practice? So that's why we're doing this mapping of all the national policies and strategies regarding antimicrobial resistance. There's many countries at the moment who are developing one, or who are updating one, and what we are trying is that the research part of these national plans are aligned with the strategy research agenda, so that there's some kind of alignment in this sense. And then we are trying to create also alignment between funders in each country. For example, a few months ago, I went to Estonia, well, there was a meeting on the microbial resistance, and there was a meeting with all the ministries, like the agriculture, the environment, the health, the research, and trying to see who is funding the different pieces of the puzzle, and how this can be combined and aligned internally. So we're not only talking about European or international alignment, but also nationally with the different funders in each country. So we are working this year specifically in this in every country to see how we can align the resources that make more sense. And that's a bit what I would talk to you today. And I really hope that also with this presentation, Labia gets more enthusiastic in, in these areas. I'm very pleased. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, that you uncovered again quite a big issue. What the humankind actually facing now, and you as researchers and doctors definitely aware about the, probably the issue which we change completely approach to the medicine. And we are talking probably about next 10, 20 years and how it, how it will change. Yep, yeah, I'm really very express and I'm looking how to, how to switch to the next presenter and next presenter will be Professor Robin Shotak. I don't know, will you start with the immunization or about vaccination of Edward Jenner, but I know that you will finish with the, with the 
perspective view on immunization. So the floor is yours. So good morning everybody. It's uh, an honour and a privilege to talk to you this morning and um, I'm going to present to you really work that's being done on uh, the Aditech programme. This is a programme funded by the European Commission looking at advanced immunisation technologies for next generation vaccines. Um, it's coordinated by Donata Medeglini from uh, Siena who couldn't be here today because she's in Brussels. Um, and it's very much a sister project with BioVac Safe, which is also looking at the safety of vaccines. So this project is really looking at the next generation of technology for developing vaccines against diseases where vaccine development has not been quite so straightforward. Um, it's a large project. Um, it has 42 participants in 30 different countries. Um, a large number of SMEs and two uh, large pharma companies. And really this has been essential to kind of leverage the knowledge and technology across Europe for uh, some of these protracted issues where vaccine development has been uh, complex. As you're probably well aware, vaccines have been really a very major public health um, intervention tool um, and have probably prevented about 3 million deaths uh, worldwide. Um, and in the period of 2011 to 2020, it will prevent another 25 million deaths, um, and that's probably about 5 million uh, preventable uh, deaths per minute um, in the world. But although early vaccine development was pioneered by many individuals, including Edward Jenner in the first place, really now it requires complex teams to bring all these different disciplines to bear on uh, vaccine development. And so by and large, it's no longer really possible for individual groups to pioneer and develop all the technologies for taking an initial concept from discovery through the developmental pathway and into proof of efficacy trials. And even the large pharmaceutical companies are really recognizing that they have to collaborate in order to be able to do this in a cost-effective manner. This represents all the different groups that are involved in the project at the moment. Um, there's certainly a scope for other groups to become involved in the Aditech project, um, although there, there isn't uh, financial provision, there's still a uh, potential benefit of getting involved in terms of network activities and being part of the data sharing and technology um, partnership uh, through the Aditech program. And really this kind of recognizes that the way we do vaccine research has changed dramatically over the years. So um, really from uh, initial kind of empirical approach to starting to be able to tap into all of the new technologies, particularly structural vaccinology that uh, is, is actually built on terms of uh, next generation modeling of many of the vaccine targets, being able to use synthetic biology, particularly nucleic acid approaches to vaccination. Um, which really uh, allow acceleration of getting vaccine concepts into clinical trials and may be particularly important in terms of rapid response to emerging infections. Um, and then in terms of understanding the human immune response. And uh, more and more focus is being placed on early human immunology um, without the traditional uh, approach of going through animal models, which may not necessarily in, it, in isolation be the best type of approach for selecting candidates that are both safe, but also uh, efficacious in a human population. And so in terms of the design strategy for Aditech, really it has a, a top-down and a bottom-up approach. The bottom-up approach really is taking new concepts and developing them through uh, a portfolio of different technologies, um, but not doing this in isolation. So this would be perhaps a traditional vaccine model 
going from discovery through animal models to humans. But really, Aditech has kind of turned it and done in parallel human uh, investigative human immunology, doing patient characterization studies, uh, studying existing vaccines in terms of understanding how they work in human populations. And so that this is done in parallel to inf cross inform the kind of uh, more uh, discovery concepts so that they're done in parallel to accelerate and expand uh, the development of new vaccine candidates. And this is particularly important, this parallel approach with human immunology as well as basic s discovery to really reduce the risk of late stage failure in vaccine trials, which is where the largest expense occurs. So trying to uh, really select things more appropriately, more rapidly, um, and improve success in developing new vaccine candidates. This just gives some of the um, uh, examples in terms of how bringing a consortium together can allow people to do the type of work that can't be done in isolation. So um, the Aditec project is focused on four key uh, antigens, really to use those across the network, not necessarily because they're the best, best antigens, so focusing on influenza, tuberculosis, and chlamydia as key uh, diseases for vaccine development. Looking at a range of different adjuvants that are coming from small biotech, from pharmaceutical companies, being able to study those in a comparative approach. And this is particularly novel because in the past many companies and pharmaceutical companies um, have not wanted such a kind of comparative approach because they've wanted to really protect not their IP but their competitive advantage. And comparison saying this type of adjuvant is different to that doesn't necessarily um, advance the field from a commercial point of view. But now they recognize that actually to be able to combat diseases and use different vaccine candidates in a range of different populations, it's really important not to just develop adjuvant approaches in empiric form, but to be able to understand at a molecular level how they're working in different populations. And then to also bring to bear a range of different uh, delivery vector strategies, again, that can be compared uh, across uh, diseases, across platforms, um, to accelerate how they can be used to their best advantage. Um, and so this gives an example in terms of some of the technology that's being applied to adjuvant development and characterization, um, particularly taking these adjuvants with the different adjuvants, studying in great detail the cytokine innate response, uh, looking at how those innate responses uh, correlate to the type of vaccine immune response so that one can move rather than from a, a guesswork approach to adjuvant selection to actually fine tune which adjuvants with which antigens give the desired immunity in your key population. Um, and that may be particularly important not just for an indication but it may be that a certain adjuvant will work better in an elderly population or might work better or be safer in a, in, in a neonatal population rather than looking at uh, individuals in terms of their average response. Um, the vaccine vectors that have been used are a range of vectors, um, all with different properties, again, may have different advantages depending on the disease indication. Um, and for example, in terms of uh, their applicability, one of the vaccine vectors that has been uh, worked on within the consortium has been one of the leading candidates in the uh, vaccine uh, approach for Ebola. So already showing some benefit of this type of collaborative approach. Um, in terms of human immuno immunology, um, we have 13 human uh, immunology clinical studies that are either completed, started, or in preparation, which is a significant number for the size of the project. Um, and some of the examples of what are being looked at are targeted immunization to see where uh, different types of immunization, whether mucosal or parenteral, um, what type of response they may give at different mucosal surfaces. Looking at challenge models, uh, where we're using infectious challenge to see a, what is the natural course of the disease and natural immune response, and then to use those challenge <coughs> models against uh, vaccination to see if the vaccination is protective. 
looking at extreme, age, extreme um, streams of age to see, again, safety, but particularly in terms of where different adjuvants are important um, at the extreme ages of life, and also using key new technologies. Um, this gives you a roadmap of some of the clinical trials, um, and you can see there's kind of a scorecard for where they are. Um, so a number of them have been uh, completed, um, and just gives you a scope and a feel for the wide range and different sites where these, this type of work is being done. So one of the examples would be um, the adjuvanted influenza vaccine trial that's been performed in infants, looking at uh, um, adjuvanted and a non-adjuvanted influenza vaccine, studying it in detail. Already we see very striking differences in terms of magnitude of response and durability of B-cell memory. Um, and so uh, not only are we seeing that these vaccines can work better, we're understanding why they work better and the signatures that are being induced that will help predict development of other vaccine candidates in those populations. And then there's been a very big focus on systems biology. Um, so to kind of complement the large trials where you may have tens of thousands of subjects but only few data points for each of those individuals, to move systems biologies to look at small numbers of subjects but get very detailed information. Now that doesn't replace the large trials, but it allows you to, to select and fine tune the start type of studies that you then want to move into larger phase of a clinical evaluation. So it means that things can be sm done smarter and more efficiently and in a more focused fashion. So again, this kind of combination of leveraging different technologies is really changing the pace and can only be done at a large consortia uh, a level. Um, in terms of uh, scientific leadership, it's already developed, uh, led to 123 publications across the consortium with uh, a high impact factor. And um, you can see in terms of the, the way uh, the project has been working, um, the first year, less publications, but as it's progressing, the number of publications are, are, are increasing to rise. It's been very instrumental to its success in terms of bringing together these different industrial partners. Um, and so there are a large number of SMEs involved, and they have found it particularly useful to raise their profile in uh, conjunction with the two large pharma companies. So they have seen it being very beneficial to be part of a large consortium to be able to show in terms of their technology um, and their capabilities in this kind of platform approach. And the two success stories is that as these two groups here have either been taken over by large pharma during the course of the project already, um, showing that cooperation and being part of this project has been very beneficial to them. Um, there's been a very strong component in terms of training, and this training is open not just to the consortium but to wider European uh, members, so uh, very strong components in training in vaccinology, so if people are interested in being involved and uh, accessing some of these courses, these are open uh, to all European partners. Um, the way that this has worked well is that in terms of the planning, it has focused on a kind of effective industrial-like management approach so that everything is very much coordinated in terms of uh, horizontal and vertical platforms and very, very uh, precisely monitored. So rather than some projects where it gets funded and then everybody goes away and does their own thing, um, the focus has been made been uh, making sure that everybody is interconnected so that the uh, research is done in a coordinated and very collaborative fashion. And, and part of that success is to have uh, a very output orientated approach where there's continual evaluation within the project to make sure that it's operating uh, correctly. So that hopefully gives you six, uh, an idea of how uh, the Aditec project is working. Um, many of you might be wondering, well, sitting here in Latvia, how could you actually become uh, involved in this sort of project, um, being that it's already been funded and is, is fairly mature? You can certainly become affiliated members, so you can join up and become part of the, the, the project. 
Um, there are open calls from SMEs and public health organisations. You can apply for training fellowships, um, and those are fully funded training fellowships. Um, and you can also uh, be involved by becoming an affiliated partner and accessing the data and the technology. Um, th this is more detail which I can leave behind if people want to learn how they can become affiliated members. It's a fa fairly easy application process um, and then that gives you full access to all the technology. And likewise, uh, it's a fairly easy access project, uh, process if you want to, to join as an SME to be involved in the research portfolio. There are lots of opportunities to, uh, to be able to access uh, information about the project through the project website. There's regular newsletters and information that, again, are, are good dissemination tools. So if you're interested, do please go to the website and be able to access um, and you can subscribe to get n regular newsletters on the programme. So what about the future? Well, I think uh, the focus of the whole project is to apply uh, the breakthrough immunisation technology to develop novel vaccines. And we're already seeing spin-offs from this project into real-world uh, vaccine uh, candidates that are moving through the clinical trial platform. Also, looking at novel vaccine adjuvants and adjuvant combinations has been a, a particular focus and a success. Because many of these adjuvants have been owned by different companies and different groups, they've been siloed in terms of the approach in the past. But through this project, we've been able to start to look at combinations of adjuvants, where one adjuvant may be very good for a priming response, and a different adjuvant may be very good for giving a boosting response. And so that's really opened up the technology. Um, there has been this, this strong, uh, a strong emphasis on rapid response technologies, <coughs> systems vaccinology, and uh, we're understanding now how many of these technologies work in elderly populations and young populations, which are particularly key targets for next generation vaccine approaches. So I will finish there and thank you very much for your attention. We are still on the conference on European Union contribution to infectious disease and research. And now we have the third part and it will be actually the uh, communication, short communication uh, in this part from the Poland and from Estonia. And so why I'm inviting Anna Rutko, national contact person of Poland, the, I am here. Yeah, you are here, very nice. Marek, Professor Marek Kowalski from Lodge. Very nice person, we have an interesting discussion during the lunch. And Argo Soon, Health National Coordinator, point, uh, contact point from Estonia, he's also here. And Professor Irja Lustar from the Tartu University. So we are ready to start. Uh, just thank you for a very nice uh, lunch, Professor Murawska, and to your brilliant team of assistants for Asia, who has done really our conference comfortable and everything ra run very smoothly. So Anna uh, Pitko will be the first presenter. She is ready with your presentation, and we will start. Is it yours? No. Ah, uh, it's okay. Here. Uh, EP? Yeah. No, no, here it's on the oh, okay. already open. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And we will make full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks organizers for inviting me. I understand that it will be also very interesting to see different national contact points, points of view because in, uh, our countries differ quite much, like Poland, uh, uh, Romania. Estonia. Polish interest in the European research in health in infectious diseases area uh, is quite specific. I may say that for sure there are people who make uh, a lot of, of research and are very advanced, but from the national point of view there is no clear line to or program to, to support uh, infectious diseases or vaccination programs. Um, we as National Contact Point are nominated by the Ministry of Science uh, in 1999, so since 16 years, 16 years we are on board and 
supporting, helping people to take part in programs. At the moment, it's Horizon 2020 and Euratom Fission. We are as well experts to all um, Horizon 2020 program committees. And uh, we lead your access network in Poland, so support for researchers with all the information needed in other countries when they are coming to work there. Uh, the map of Poland is because our network who consists of 11 regional contact points. Not each voivodeship has its uh, regional contact points, but they are in main uh, research centers. So we are placed neither in the ministry nor in the financing, financing agency. What is in the top, our national contact point, is in the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research, Polish Academy of Sciences. I will tell what were information sources for my presentation and for my knowledge about infectious diseases in Poland, research in Poland, uh, what is national governmental interest and what is Polish presence in the European research uh, showing several projects and institutions involved in that. The best sources, in my opinion, um, uh, are two. It means health competence, which is the European FP7 uh, program project and uh, incorporates all projects related to health. So it means that also from nanomaterials or nanotechnologies, uh, information and communication uh, societies, so, so tools. Uh, for, Marie, before, for Marie Curie program, uh, uh, any other of FP7. So looking for contacts, looking for other um, uh, leading um, uh, teams, it's very easy and very good to use this database. Uh, then CORDIS, which is the oldest one, but still renewated and currently focused on information, not uh, on, on proposal preparation and uh, calls. Uh, I have searched in national uh, level uh, project database but I may say that it's a very difficult at the moment source of, of um, uh, knowledge. So mainly uh, it will be uh, the, the, the information is based on European sources. Uh, more or less it shows also the um, governmental interest of su su such kind of, of database. It's under preparation, I think, uh, since three or four years to have possibility to, to find uh, who is doing what and why. Here will be only uh, two slides just to have a, a concept, an idea. We have two agencies who finance research. Uh, this one, National Center for Research and Development, is closer to market and is for uh, applied projects and it has strategic programs, national programs, and defense and uh, security programs, international programs and European funds in terms of structural funds. And this, their web page is only in Polish, so I just uh, show how it looks. They have enormous amount of projects, of areas, of uh, programs and a lot, a lot of money. So uh, uh, the, the the outcome in terms of good database is is quite difficult to uh, to be done. Uh, running for spending uh, enormous amount of money in this um, agency, there is a Stratec Med program for prevention and treatment of diseases of civilization with two. Uh, 100 million euro. It's, uh, uh, I think it's ending and it was focused on cardiology and cardiosurgery, oncology, neurology and senses and regenerative medicine. Though in those areas we have infectious diseases for sure, uh, they are not separated. 
And the last one information about agencies, it's National Science Center and it's like European Research Council with 25 panels on um, uh, uh, areas in three broad sections and those sections I have uh, put it in English. This center has their information as well in uh, English. So we have life sciences with six or seven um, more detailed areas as well not exactly um, uh, called uh, infectious. Uh, the, the difference between two agencies in terms of, of use of them is that National Science Center has uh, music names for different kinds of actions like opus, preludium, sonata, and if they need two partners, it's tango or polones. So, <laughs> so yes, but it's you know it's clear, it's yeah. easy to, to, to follow and. Uh, f but they don't have topics. The, the people apply for 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 um, uh, instruments, let's say. So it's uh, 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 it's all regarding the the uh, research funding situation, uh, and in both agencies, after each call, you have results. And if you want to find something, you have to go through each call. Uh, via almost paper results, so we are uh, um, really waiting for for the change uh, and for use the the hmm, on one hand uh, very difficult, on another very useful informatic tools. Difficult, I mean uh, mentally, because they use a lot of money, and then if you want anything, you can't, you don't have any, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but it looks that okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, of course, we we take part as as a country in joint programming initiative of antimicrobial resistance, and we are in one. We as a Poland, we are in one uh, project. It's Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry, Polish Academy of Sciences. The only one for, it was one call, yeah, but still. The biggest beneficiary of European money, I may say that, is, is um, Medical University in Lodz, and in, uh, they have 18 projects in FP7, nine is still ongoing, of which two uh, are related to antibiotics and one of Professor Kowalski who is present here and will <coughs> tell more about his point of view and, 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 uh, and uh, projects. Uh, it's uh, post-infectious immune reprogramming and its association with persistent and chronicity of resp respiratory allergic diseases. I may say that Professor is many uh, 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 linked or, or the best in allergies. Yes? I hope so. Uh, uh, Infect era is the, the one era net where we have uh, Polish participation of University of Gdańsk after two evaluated calls, we have one partner. He is very uh, glad to be here, and I was talking with him, so, so it's uh, interesting. It's hepatitis B, and we have at the top two uh, ag agencies, two uh, uh, funding agencies, because even from outside uh, initiatives, if something is basic, NCN is responsible if something is applied and CBR. So it's a little complicated, but it works that way. In tuberculosis, also only one project, one participation uh, in FP7 by Institute of Biochemistry and Biophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. Um, and the main institution, I will read what they do because, because it's uh, their purpose to, to, to know such a things. It's National Institute of Public Health, National 
uh, Institute of Hygiene, and they have to protect the health of the population uh, through actions taken in the field of public health, including research and training. This refers to the monitoring of biological, chemical, and physical risk factors in food, water, and air, as well as diseases and infectious uh, control. Uh, this institute offers expertise for the government, NGOs, and civil society in the field of public health risk assessment and indication how to avoid risk, and also conducts research of sera and vaccines quality. So to be honest, in principle, it, it, in principle, this institute should be the, the, the best partners for, uh, for such uh, a project, at least in, uh, uh, in, in, in shape of public health. health yeah? And uh, as Cornelius told, this institute, uh, no, he didn't tell that this institute, but he told about the project IMOV Plus of public health platform, and that this institute is a partner there. Also, in another, another network of excellence, uh, consisting of 25 partners, Eurocord, uh, for uh, HIV AIDS cohort studies, and like uh, John, Joanna told, uh, uh, the total amount is, uh, well, European contribution, almost 12 million euro, then for Poland is almost 80,000 euro. So the, the, the uh, and it's, it, it, it works in our country more or less in terms of money, it's um, quite difficult. Completely different program, uh, so the, the second public health program under DG Santé, but from the side of institu uh, Institute also uh, um, on uh, HIV topic. I have somehow, it's, it's, this, this uh, slide should be in another place. Under microbial drug resistance, we have a person who is, a, let's say, a hero of the uh, microbiology in Poland, and she's Professor um, Valeria Hreniewicz in National Medicines uh, Institute, and she is the national consultant in the field of medical microbiology. Um, and uh, scientific uh, expert in joint programming initiative antimicrobial by resistance. Also, she was uh, she created a national program for antibiotics protection, and it was um, under umbrella of Ministry of Health. Though it was kind of program with um, medical uh, 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 interest, but not additional money. And this program was uh, to, to prepare recommendations how to uh, deal with different um, uh, situation of infections for hospitals and for uh, others. Uh, I think this year this program is ending. I don't know what will be later on because Professor uh, uh, can't be one, one man show, let's say. And she was in, in FP7 in four uh, projects relating to antimicrobial drug resistance. Uh, it, one of them is still mm, ongoing. Mm, it's the end of my information. I may say that in Poland we still have areas for development and what would advice to us, to you, to, 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 to uh, new member states, to smaller uh, groups, to use infrastructure and to use Marie skłodowska uh, actions uh, to uh, strengthen um, uh, links and cooperation between different countries and different sectors, let's say. And to national contact points at the end are free. Uh, I am mainly um, uh, responsible for IMI initiative, my colleague Eva for health, and one more Joanna for eHealth, which currently is a very, very strong part in the uh, uh, Horizon program. Thank you very much. Thank you.
very much. Uh, applause is for you. Very creative contact points, especially with tango, polonaise. <laughs> of course, it's it's it's, it's, it's Poland, but we will have opportunity to uh, to compare because we will have the presentation from another contact points. But now we continue. Uh, we have seen organizational part. Now we will go for the research part. Uh, the title is very complicated, but definitely it will be about predictor what we have seen here. Yeah, and you will update the status, what has done. Professor uh, Marek Kowalski from Luch. You need to present it. How it works, let's see. Yeah, the first one. The first one, Yeah, it's stable. Can you present presentation? Yeah. Yeah, in full screen. It's my, oh, OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mario Kowalski. I am from Łódź, Poland. At first, I would like to introduce myself who I, I am not. I am not an infectiologist, so this is the first point. The second, I would like to congratulate you for organizing these, these wonderful conference, very exciting presentations. I enjoy it very much. Uh, uh, during my talk, I would like to share with you my sort of very personal experience with firmware programs. And actually, I, 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 maybe I will somehow address those questions which were asked here, uh, how to get to those projects. <laughs> uh, well, in, in general, I, I would say that this is this, this St. Matthews effect. The, 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 richer get, the rich get richer, the poorer get poorer. And this is the general rule in, 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 in these in this programs. And uh, to, 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 uh, to overcome this, this is a really a, a real, real task. And it's not very easy. We know it very well. Uh, well, the. How to move on? Uh, to do, not just show come. Show come. OK, I got it. It doesn't. This one, OK, I got it. I got yes. it. OK, yeah. Well, the. the no, but it's not the first one. No, I lost. <laughs> okay, I lost. I lost my first slide. But anyway, <laughs> allergies are uh, diseases which are related to the, the interaction of the environment with the, with, with the immunological system, and they are in fact exaggerated responses of the immune system, resulting in in in, in disease state. The most common allergies are bronchial asthma. Uh, allergic rhinitis, anaphylaxis, and other, other organ-related uh, allergic diseases. We know that over the last three or four decades, the prevalence of allergic diseases inc is increasing. In Europe, it's increasing actually worldwide. And we call it the, uh, the, 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 the epidemic of, of allergy. At present, it's been estimated that up to 30% of the world population suffer from allergy. And those diseases, they have high morbidity and may, maybe also even life threatening. They have also significant effect of, on, on patient life, on the quality of, of patient's life, and they have high economic impact on the, on the society. It's, it's been estimated that up to, up to 30,000, up, up to 30 billion euro annually, is, uh, this is the cost of, of allergies for direct and indirect costs in, uh, just, just in Europe. Well, so these are those, those allergy diseases. This is another presentation. I'm sorry, I mixed my presentation. <laughs> OK, so uh, why it is important to talk about allergies? Because there are, there, there are many gaps in our knowledge in the, in the field of allergy. In fact, we don't know what are the real factors uh, influencing development of allergy and responsible for these epidemics of, of allergic diseases. We are not clear about the basic mechanism of pro progression and development, the development and pro progression of allergies. And we also are not fully aware about effective measures and also effective treatment modalities for, for allergic diseases. So the answer to that, of course, is, is the high quality of research. And these questions were actually put forward at the beginning of this century, in the, in, in the middle of, 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 of tens of this, of, of this century, by the group of European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology colleagues. And at this time, we realized that the major resources of um, the funding, they come from the, from the European framework programs. And as you, you know very well, the, the, the seven framework program contributed more than 50 billion euros to, to research. Of course, only a small portion of that went to the health research, and no, in fact, went to the, to the allergy research. 
So uh, within the first to the second framework program, allergy and asthma were not listed as thematic priorities. So the only way to apply for the projects related to allergy and asthma was to apply to food quality, environmental life sciences. And of course, several projects were funded, but it wasn't very, it wasn't very, very easy. Uh, in 2001, the European Academy of Allergy, uh, this is the, the, the Europe-wide um, uh, organization of allergies, which I was, I was, I was part of the, of the executive body at, the, at this time, we decided to lobby for allergy at the European level. So we opened the office in, 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 in Brussels, and we invested in this office hundreds of thousands of euros from our, from our organization money for more than six years. As a result, and we launched the, the, the campaign which was with, with, with the title Today One Child in Two is Allergic. And this, this campaign was very successful in fact. We were granted, a, we applied and eventually were granted a, 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 a project within the, within the food quality. So it was not under allergy because allergy was not there, but we got it under the food quality. And the project was the, the, the network, in fact. It was a network called Global Allergy and Asthma European Network. It was a network for excellence, and they, with, the, with the acronym Galen. And the name came from the, from the Galenos, the first physician, which described the relationship between the upper and lower, and lower airways. The coordinator of this project was Ghent University, and we got almost 15, 15 million euros of, 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 of funding. Well, the, 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 the project, the project uh, was created by, in fact, by 21 partners from more than 10 European countries and included more than 500 researchers from those countries plus two uh, 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 Europe-wide association, European Academy of Allergy and European Patients Organization, IFA. Well, the Galen, uh, just to, to tell you in few words what the, what the Galen achieved, the Galen, uh, although it's still expanding, it's still working as a beyond, the, beyond the, the original funding, so the, the, the total outcome of the, of the Galen was more than 500 papers. More than 80 papers, as a position papers, practical gu guidelines, which actually are, are, are currently sort of standards in the field of allergy and immunology in, in, in Europe, but also worldwide, worldwide. And it was really an impressive um, uh, achievement, since we calculated that more than one paper was, was generated per 70,000 euros, which among this type of projects is, 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 is really exceptional. And Galen actually survived the, survived the, pro the, the, the timeline of the, of, of the European funding. Uh, we created a foundation which, is, which allows us to still to collaborate, to work together, and we are still developing projects within other, with a, without our fundings, but the Galen as an as a, as a entity still exists, although the, 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 found, the, the founding has already ceased. Well, and despite this lobbying, when the, when the seventh framework program was, was about to, to, to be started, we realized that there is no, again, there is no allergy within the seventh framework program. So it was very surprising for us. Again, we tried to approach the European, the European Commission, and we are lucky enough that at this time, the rapporteur of the project was Professor Jerzy Buzek. He, he, he is the, 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 the previous uh, prime minister of, of, of Poland. So we convinced him that allergy is a really important, important field. And if we had a presentation to the European, uh, community, European uh, Parliament members in, in, in Brussels, and as a result, Professor Bruzek proposed an amendment to the, to, to the final, final proposal for the seventh framework program. And in the latest version, the, this, 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 this was proposed by, the, by several political groups. This is the level where you have to lobby you know, if you want to achieve anything. It was supported by these, these political groups. And eventually, this, the, this, this, this phrase, respiratory diseases, including those induced by allergies, were included into the seventh framework program. But believe me, it, it took us several months of hard work to go, to go these few words into the seventh framework program. Well, so the, as a result of this, of this uh, I would say to some, I, have, I dare to say, um, of, of this lobbying, several projects were, were, were more, than, more than 60 projects were actually founded in, within the seventh framework program related to, the, to various aspects of, of allergy or, 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 or asthma. And I was um, lucky enough to be involved in, in four uh, framework programs 
uh, which were which arise from this from this uh, seven framework program. The medal, the medal, which is one of the uh, which is still going on, actually is related to the mechanism development of allergy fast. Is, is a, the, the goal of this project is to develop a vaccine, but it's not a vaccine uh, against infec infections. This is a vaccine against allergy. So th it's going to be the first ever in the world uh, the, the vaccination for patients sensitive to, to fish, to allergic, allergic, to, allergic to fish. Predicta is another, is another project which, which is related to the role of infections in, 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 in development and exacerbation of, of, of bronchial asthma. And I found this is a, a project related to, to, food, to, food, to food allergy. I don't have time to, 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 to describe, to discuss with you all, all these projects. I just want to mention you again, referring to the, to the St. Matthew effects, how the projects uh, were, were born. In fact, the Galen, within the Galen, the first project which we, which we, which we proposed, it was still within the six framework program, it was Europrivé. Europrivé was, was focusing on food allergy. It was the, the large multinational, more than 50 partners project where we're looking at the epidemiology, but also part of mechanics of food allergy. And from this project, Europrivé, the another two two offsprings or spin-offs or offsprings of children, as I'm saying, uh, were, were born. The first which I described, which is, which is the, 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 the vaccination, the desensitization to, to food allergy, to fish allergy, and the IFAM, which is a sort of continuation of the Europrivé. Within the Europrivé, we developed one of the, one of the, <coughs> the, 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 the concept was to, was to develop a bird cohort of children, bird cohort, to, to follow up the development of, of, of food allergy. And we recruited at this time, it was, it was in between 2005 to 2007, we recruited throughout the Europe more than 12,000 12, children. The project lasted two years, two years actually, so we were able to follow the children for two years only. The project ended and there was no other way to get any funding for, 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 for the project. So we started a huge cohort and there were no money to continue. So we are lobbying within the sixth framework program, with the seventh framework program, eventually we got this IFAM project and one of one of work packages of this IFAM project is related to to continuation of this of this um, uh, bird cohort. So now these 12,000 children they are coming back to our to our to our offices, and we are we, we, we have a chance to follow the development of, of allergy of food allergy in those children over the last six seven. They are actually between seven and eight years old right now. In our department, we have 1,500 children which were originally recruited in Europe and now are being followed. We hope they will be followed because it's not very easy to, to get them back to the project after seven years. But we are, we are trying to, 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 do that, to do that. Well, so this is the one, one, one track, I, I, I would say, for, from arising from, from, from Galen. The, the second, which I was in, involved in, I'm involved in, this is the, it involves two projects. One this is the, the Predicta project, which is, as I mentioned, related to the role of viral infections in, in, in exacerbation of, of um, uh, bronchial asthma, especially in children, there are several several interesting uh, uh, conclusions coming out of this project. We we, we we develop a chip. We are developing actually a chip to to de to de detect detect the the the, um, uh, the viral response to to to, to, rhino, uh, to rhinovirus immunological response to vi rhinovirus infe infection am, am, among other. Uh, and uh, the medal project, which is which is still going on, uh, however, it it, it has significantly is, is actually expanding our no knowledge on the on the pathophysiology of of, of, of allergy. Well, so the uh, the now it's it's the Latvian uh, time. The, you, you you have the presidency of the of the European Community. Five years ago, Poland was uh, had the presidency of the European com Community, and at this time. We managed to brought allergy and asthma to the to the to this to this uh, our to, to our presidency, and Polish presidency uh, made allergy and asthma prevention, early diagnosis and treatment a priority for the European uh, public health policy. So it was very important achievement. Uh, we had a meeting in, in, in Poland, and later on, this, this, this proposal was approved by representatives of 27 member states. And we proposed several measures how to, uh, how to address this, this problem of, of this uh, allergy epidemic worldwide and in, in, in Europe. But at the very end, one of the conclusions of this, of this, um, uh, of this um, uh, priority was that, the, that these measures 
uh, have a positive effect, will have a positive effect on child development and quality of life and contribute to an active and healthy childhood, but also and to healthy aging. We understood at this time that there is a link between the development of diseases in the early or, the, or, or the health in, in the childhood and the health and development of diseases in the, in the elderly. Uh, just relating to talking about the allergy disease, as we know allergic diseases they are developing over the lifetime, starting from early sensitization in, the, in, in utero, there are some specifically um, uh, specific food allergies, we are specific for young children, the other diseases they develop during the lifetime. However, it is interesting, it, it turns out that, for example, the, the allergies may be also a significant risk, fa risk factor for non-allergic diseases. There are several studies documenting that severe asthma in the childhood is a risk factor for development of COPD, chronic obstructive airway disease, which is a non-allergic disease, which usually is related to smoking. But this severe asthma is a risk factor for, for, for COPD without smoking. So this is a strong factor for development of the airway disease in patients. It refers to many other areas of, 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 of human health. So we, if we think about, about uh, aging, about healthy aging, we should think about, 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 about uh, ch childhood. And in fact, the aging of the society is, is, a, is a European, is also the worldwide problem. The, the European population is, is, is aging, although the situation Different in different European countries. From this map, it looks like, like Latvia is in, in, in a little bit <coughs> even worse situation than, than, than is Poland. However, we estimate that although we, we, we know that although now uh, below 20% of the population is, is above 65, which we consider elderly, within the next 20 years, close to 30% of the population will be above, above, 30, uh, above, above 60, 60, 65. Well, when, when we look the, uh, for aging, the, we, we should have also other perspective. This is the perspective of the, of the, of the proportion of, of, of elderly population to those population between 20 and, and 64, the working po population. And the situation right now is like the, the, this, this, this proportion is 20, 21%. This is the average for Europe. Poland is here, um, Latvia is here, still a little bit below the, the average, however, in, in 40 years from now, the estimate that the, the average for Europe will be 58, and the, the, the Poland and Latvia still together will have more than 70 percent of those uh, of the per percent of those of those elderly as compared as compared to active po to active population. So this is really annoying, and we have to think about it on our, on our, when we think about our, our activities, also our research. There are, of course, several issues which are related to, to, to the aging population. There is a decreasing, uh, decreasing physical activity with, uh, with age, which is obvious, and there is an increasing number of multi, multimorbidities, which means that the elderly, they, they usually they have several diseases. On average, as a, 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 an, 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 an elderly patient in, in Poland, person, above 65 has four, four different diseases. Four different diseases, this is on average. So this is again, this is a, a, a clear, a clear you know, problem, clear medical, um, medical, medical issues. So what is, the, what, is the, what is the answer to this? From, the, from, from our standpoint, the, the answer would be the concept of so-called healthy aging. And healthy aging is defined as the development of main, and maintenance of optimal physical, mental and social well-being and function in older adults. Well, there are several strategies which, 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 which could be used and which actually some of them were, were, were suggested by, by the, the, the WHO. I would like to focus only on one of these strategies. This is to address gaps in the evidence and research in this, in this area. This is where we can really uh, do, do, some, do something. Of course, the, the healthy aging is, is a growing area of research right now. Why? Because there are so many different questions, there are so many gaps which are still, still un, un, unfilled. We don't know, actually, we don't have a working definition of healthy aging. We are currently working, working on that. We don't know what is the effect of, effect of factors which are operating acro across life uh, and have the effect on, on, on healthy aging, how we can affect healthy aging process and the, at the population level and also at the individual level. And also we don't know if, if how we can intervene and when to intervene and actually what, what to change in the, in, the, in, in the life in order to, 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 to help people to, to really 
uh, get older uh, more healthy. Uh, to uh, address these this, 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 this challenges, um, at the medical university in which um, five years ago we decided to establish a healthy aging research center with a mission to support and advance healthy aging through biomedical research, education, collaborative partnership at European, national and, 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 local, and local level. Uh, a year later, we applied to the European Commission, and we got granted the project, the record project, which is which is similar in terms of, of the of the uh, as an instrument to to, 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 to your project. Uh, the name of the project is Healthy Aging Research Research Center. Center. The project was funded for 36 months, and we got 4.5 million euro, and we started the project two, two years ago. Two years ago. So now I'd like, I would like to tell you a little bit about, about this project, which is still going on. The aims of this project were to enhance the uh, scientific excellence of our center to become a top-level medical research in the field of aging-related diseases, and also to, to increase the participation of, of our researchers in international research and in development of, no, of innovation. And the third part of, of, of our goals were to promote active a aging in our community, but also countrywide and also Europe-wide, if, if, if possible. The, we decided to, to, to include four, four research groups uh, with mm, total more than 50, 50 researchers, and we identified four major areas when we, were, when we were good and we could really progress, we could do something in, in, interesting. And in order to, 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 to go ahead with our, with our, with our projects, we also uh, committed uh, 21 international partners to collaborate with us uh, within, within this project. The major area of, of what we call the research areas of Hans project are the improving well-being in the elderly, the second are uh, neurodegenerative disorders in, in the elderly, the second respiratory, uh, the third respiratory cardiovascular and renal diseases, and the fourth module, the fourth area, is related to molecular basis of, 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 of aging. Well, we have, as I mentioned, we have 21 partners um, spread over, over Europe, and we, we closely collaborate with those partners. They are actually partners which we use, with most of them we started collaboration long before the, the, the project actually was, was, was started. So it was actually to continue and to enhance the collaboration with, this, with these partners. Well, so how we, what, 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 we, what we made of, out of European money? Well, we got money for, for, for international exchange of scientists. There are dozens of, of our scientists going abroad to our, our international partners, and there are also international partners coming to work to, in, 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 our, in our labs. This, this exchange, what we call twinning, is still going, is still going on. We had also a chance to recruit a new researcher to our laboratories. We, we, we recruited, in, in an international context, we recruited eight new, new, new researchers and also te technicians. We developed a platform for innovation, attracting small and medium enterprises to, to collaborate uh, within, this, within this area. And we also uh, spent a lot of money and effort on the promotion and dissemination of healthy aging in Poland and also, and also in Europe. And thanks to those funding, we also could improve our, our, our research infrastructure. Uh, this, the, the, we, we created what we call the virtual laboratory. When we, we, this is a network of laboratories uh, within the university. And we, we created a biobank, which is which is major focus of this biobank, will be, will be the studies of, uh, within the area of, of, of aging related, related diseases. Thanks to the funding, we also, as I mentioned, we significantly uh, improved our, our, our uh, research infrastructure from um, genomics to, 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 to clinical, to clinical in, in instruments. And we also um, uh, pay attention and contribute to the international vis visibility of our research goals, but also to, to promote healthy aging in, 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 in our community. Uh, we are closely collaborating with patient associations. We organize the Academy of, of Healthy Aging, which is a very active body in, the, in, our, in, our, in our city, collaborating with local, local, local author authorities, local, local government. We are also uh, uh, trying to be involved in the training of physicians and students in the area of geriatrics and, 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 and they are related to, 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 healthy, to healthy aging. We have active website, which I will show you in a, in a moment. And we are also organizing, or, or the, organizing 
conferences. And last week, last last month, actually, we just we just concluded a the first conference on, on translational research in in the area of healthy aging. The goal of this uh, conference was to, to create a bridge between 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 basic science and clinical application, clinical science in the field of of healthy aging. And this this conference was very successful with more than 300 uh, 300 100 participants, uh, more than 40 speakers from all over Europe. Uh, and so we, we are very satisfied with this conference and we plan to organize similar conference next year, um, a year from now in April 2016. So you are, you are, you are, you are welcome. Well, there are several research projects which, are, which, which, which are, were either uh, initiated before or are, are, are being currently, currently developed within, within the, uh, the Health um, uh, Consortium. Uh, starting from, from clinical projects related to the effect of nutrition on, on dementia, uh, back to, to, to molecular mechanisms uh, in, in tissue fibrosis and cancerogenesis. On my favorite topic, the, the role of microRNA is dysregulation of, of and, and susceptibility to, to viral infections in the elderly elderly populations. We are still developing new projects. We are we are currently uh, involved in preparation of several projects. We are also. Uh, involved in several preparation to the 2020 uh, program. So, uh, well, so what? What to, 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 to conclude? Where, where we are heading? What, what, what do we what, what do we want to achieve? We want to further uh, develop the international collaboration uh, with European partners, not only with those partners which we already have within within heart, but also with new partners from from, for example, from Baltic countries. We are very much interested in that. Uh, we are working on increasing the innovation capacity of, 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 of our center through collaboration with industrial partners. I will refer to that in, in a moment. We are also expanding the research by joint application to the Horizon 2020 programs. And we are working hard on achieving sustainability of HARS project beyond the lifetime of the, of the, of the financing. Because after 10, uh, 12 months from now, the financing from the European Commission will be over and we will have to get by. We want the, our, our center to survive and to develop beyond this, beyond this, this project. Just, just, just recently, at the beginning of this year, a, 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 a significant, uh, a significant uh, well, um, event uh, was held, actually, it was, it, it, this is a, something which we are very proud of that uh, together with the medical university, uh, we, we were selected by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology uh, into the private, um, uh, public-private partnership, what, what is called Knowledge and Innovation Communities, or KISS, KISS InnoLife. And this partnership um, allows for, uh, for access to actually the strongest consortium which is dedicated to, to active life and healthy aging in the European Union with a life uh, timeline to 2030. There are several um, uh, industrial partners which are, which are supporting this, this program, so we also hope that this program which, which help us also to, to achieve the sustainability and to further develop the, the, the project. So I invite all of you to collaboration with us, to get in touch with us. And this is our website where you can get some information on, the, on, 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 on our project. And I also, you are welcome also to, to visit our university, Medical University of Łódź, and also our charming city, which is also as, almost as charming as, as Riga, uh, which, which is Łódź in, in, in central Poland. So thank you very much. Thank you very Professor Kowalski. So we, uh, now it's time for, for questions, short questions for the both speaker. We will combine in one block. Any? Okay, we will go forward because next presenters will be from our neighbors from Estonia and uh, Argo Soon, national health, national contact person from Estonia. Okay, hello to everybody. It's nice to be in Riga again. Thank you for organizers for that. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, somebody asked me how many times I have been in Riga. Uh, I don't know the exact 
answer what you said about uh, 20 times. It's a bit less than uh, visits to Brussels, but uh, still quite a uh, good place. Um, and I hope uh, that I'll, uh, my uh, presentation will be uh, sort of uh, easy listening. I try to avoid uh, uh, boring uh, details and have kind of um, general approach. I still hope that there will be a piece of information inside. Um, we will continue with um, geography. For those who don't remember exactly where Estonia is, or Latvia is always also presented here, uh, just European map and um, uh, Estonia is here. Uh, in international um, uh, events, uh, there, are, there is always somebody in the auditory uh, who uh, doesn't remember exactly. So uh, I, I uh, keep those slides and uh, present it uh, again and again and again. Well, it's Estonia, Riga is somewhere here down. Um, and uh, why a uh, map of Estonia? Uh, just to uh, remember, maybe uh, Latvians know very well, uh, but others uh, maybe not. That we have um, actually research concerned in um, two towns. I have some doubt about whether we have any city, but <laughs> um, our capital is uh, Tallinn and uh, our university town is uh, Tartu, even closer to Latvia. And uh, when we uh, regard medical research, we should rather consider Tartu. So there are some research teams also working in Tallinn, but these are two locations where our universities are located and uh, let's say 99% probably uh, research is done in those two sex, uh, um, locations. So a few um, branches, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, agricultural research, which are located outside um, those cities, but uh, generally we have to consider those towns. What's going on in Estonia? 4% um, of research funding comes from uh, framework programs. This percentage um, seems pretty small. Uh, but uh, when we look at the um, uh, budget of research, uh, majority of, those, of this uh, funding uh, goes the, to the, not to the researchers uh, directly, but to the <coughs> research institutions. So majority is somehow um, uh, bound to uh, uh, one or another um, academical uh, institution. And uh, when we are considering um, grants uh, which are uh, provided to um, um, uh, researchers on competition basis, uh, the share is uh, slightly different. And uh, if we uh, take all these um, competition-based uh, grants, uh, the share of uh, European grants uh, is much higher. It's not half of, uh, of those uh, all, but uh, it's, it's much more than 4%. So it's a little bit confusing number. Um, we had more than 2,000 applicants in all topics uh, in Framework Program 7. And uh, quite many of those were successful. And another confusing thing is that uh, is all these uh, statistics about uh, success rate and, and, and whatever. Because sometimes, um, yeah, I skip this part because there are several ways to do it. And uh, if you do it yourself, you never get the same numbers as uh, someone else gets. So in health area, we uh, were, had actually uh, 175 trials and uh, quite many of those were successful. Uh, and Estonian uh, SMEs are quite uh, active. Um, I remember uh, in um, health areas actually there were among um, uh, proposals some uh, 30 SMEs, but the uh, majority of them uh, were not successful, but it uh, shows that they are really active. So, and as I told, I uh, tried to um, avoid uh, nasty uh, comparisons and maybe, maybe also uh, kind of painful uh, critics. But Estonian success in uh, framework program is uh, somewhere between uh, two averages when, uh, whenever 
they are considered. So we are in upper um, part of uh, EU uh, 13 and uh, there are few countries in uh, EU 15 which are uh, performing um, less e effectively than uh, Estonia. So we are in the middle, it means on the average. These are our numbers on health research. So we got uh, quite many participations uh, throughout the framework program. Many is, uh, yeah, uh, for us is quite many, but uh, at European level not so. But people were very active in the beginning of the uh, seventh framework program, not so successful. And uh, actually the number of uh, successful projects is, has not changed so much as the uh, number of unsuccessful uh, proposals. So, but uh, yeah, I don't have a clear explanation for uh, those columns here. Um, there was a drop of, um, uh, of uh, topics uh, open to uh, proposals in, uh, uh, during those years. Maybe yeah, Estonians didn't like those so much. Or uh, another um, kind of speculative uh, explanation might be that uh, people capable to uh, obtain money from uh, a framework program, they were already uh, busy with uh, projects and uh, were not able to um, apply for uh, another one. Altogether, number is uh, more or less 54. Uh, I can't uh, say exact number because the number is slightly changing, but because uh, now I, ha I hope there will be no more uh, participants, but uh, usually it happens that we get uh, data from European Commission, but after that there are some partners joining existing consortia later on, so we, 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 it's, it's uh, rather hard to say how many participations we have. What I was afraid of um, in the beginning of the uh, seventh uh, framework program is that uh, we have some of uh, um, strong research team in certain areas. But it turned out that actually we are successful uh, in, uh, even in, uh, in uh, most of the areas provided uh, by this um, work program. Successful were nine SMEs and uh, several of those had more than one project. As I showed these uh, geographical slides in the beginning, uh, majority of health research is done in uh, Tartu uh, at uh, Tartu University or uh, also many projects are run by uh, university hospitals. Uh, we re regret that uh, we were not successful in coordinating uh, projects in health topics. Uh, there were coordination in, uh, in other topics, so together in the seventh framework program, some 30, uh, but, uh, but not in health. <coughs> in some um, terms, it, it might be even good, uh, less responsibility and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a uh, pity. Um, again, a uh, map of Europe, and um, uh, I try to present who are our friends. Uh, or who are the coordinators who take us uh, on board. And actually, uh, we can't uh, make very uh, nice conclusions here. Uh, it's obvious that uh, most um, coordinators uh, are from uh, bigger countries, which is natural. We were expecting that uh, number in the Nordic countries, which are um, our uh, neighbors and uh, which are uh, more or less uh, our friends, that uh, there will be more uh, from those countries. Maybe these uh, numbers are slightly bigger than uh, expected, but uh, general, generally our, we don't have um, uh, much preferences. What we actually see on this uh, slide is uh, another issue, uh, which is not um, my special concern. However, uh, we miss um, coordinated from Eastern Europe, European countries. That, 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 that is one uh, very uh, speci uh, special feature. But it concerns only health project where Estonians are participants. Um, 
how our topics are covered. Um, uh, so biotechnology is, uh, if you remember, the work program of uh, FP7. It's the uh, first pillar in his health topics. Uh, so it's a different kind of disease was the uh, second one and third one is uh, public health. And our today's topic is quite nice uh, piece of this uh, cake. So the cake itself is not very big, but uh, altogether for health we got some 12 million euros throughout these uh, seven years, which is not bad, but could be better. I'm kind of, I don't know whether optimist or pessimist, but I always uh, see that there is uh, some place for improvement. Um, in those projects we participated seven were about uh, infectious diseases and um, actually most important uh, topics also uh, discussed earlier here today are also covered by uh, our researchers and uh, here I will stop my presentation and I hope I gave a um, kind of introdu introduction to our next speaker to Professor Lutzer. Very good. much and, and this is, I know it's more difficult to talk in the afternoon than in the morning because everybody is drowsy after this nice lunch. First of all I want to thank our colleagues from Latvia inviting us to present and then first of uh, most of all uh, organizing this interesting and important meeting in Latvia. And I'm talking on the topic which is close to my heart. My, my background is, or, or I'm a specialist in pediatric infectious diseases, so that's my background and that's how I'm related to infectious diseases. But one of the, one of the questions I already have risen is the, uh, what, what's the, uh, whether, whether you should do the, the research in the Eastern Europe or we can extrapolate data from Western Europe. And I'm trying to make a case that uh, they, you can't extrapolate everything in this life that research need to be conducted also in, in Eastern Europe. That's how I start the lecture of infectious diseases, it, uh, which was said already in 1969 by Surgeon General William Stewart in the United States. He is a sort of high-level, or he was at that time high-level political figure, and he said that it's time to close the books on infectious diseases. The one thing he didn't say that who won the war. So he said that war is over, but he didn't say who won. So, so it uh, it appeared to be uh, so that it even appeared to be that the war is uh, not uh, not over. I hope that the parks did not win the war. And and the studies should be conducted in Eastern Europe. And I bring you a few uh, few examples. Uh, there are, there are, first of all, there are several differences between prevalence of infectious diseases between East and West. Um, there, uh, they, they also the approach to infectious diseases is, is different. And if you look at this slide uh, where uh, the colors don't show up very well to you, they show much better up to me, this basically is showing the, the newly diagnosed case, cases of HIV infection across Europe. And if you look at here, this is, say this is an eastern part of Europe and this is western part of Europe, you can clearly see that the sort of dark colors or higher incidence is happening in eastern Europe. And it was in 2012 and the situation is still like this. So, so we, we need to uh, sort of uh, specifically look uh, at the situation, but is happening in, in Eastern Europe in, in, in terms of HIV infection. Now if you look at the antibiotic resistance that was already um, uh, discussed today by, uh, by, by people from ECDC and, and, and you can see that there are more color, colors in this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, in these slides and the sort of green colors like uh, 
uh, would, would show those countries with a very low resistance rate, and the darker colors would show the countries with a higher resistance rate. And here again, you can see that the eastern part of the <coughs> eastern southern part of Europe has has a sort of uh, more reddish colors, whereas the western and northern part has green colors. And the, the sort of worst thing is that the colors, the, this map certainly has more red colors than that one. And there's the difference with about five years. So the antibiotic resistance is, is, a, is a very different. It's, I'm not coming from the country with high antibiotic resistance, but in general, there is more antibiotic resistance in Eastern Europe than it is in, especially in, in, in Northern Europe. And, and, uh, and there, there are obviously uh, reasons for that. And now if you look at the antibiotic use or, or antibiotic use reflecting the medical system, uh, then, then again, Europe is very variable. There are on the top of all the lowest antibiotic consumption is, is Netherlands, Estonia and Latvia. And, and if, you co if you look at this, is, this lower part, the, there are countries of southern Europe uh, and, and Belgium, France, Belgium is not quite Southern Europe, but Cyprus and, and Greece certainly, uh, certainly are. And, and so the sort of sad thing again is that if you look at the differences, what is happening in 10 years, nothing is changed. Those countries who had low antibiotic consumption still have low uh, 10 years later, and those who had high, they still have high. So, so again, we need to understand what are the reasons of, of this antibiotic, different antibiotic consumption. And this is all in the, in the background of new antibiotics not coming into the market. They, they are quite uh, poor. Also, the human attitude, uh, and this is just an example uh, on flu vaccination. And if you look at the flu vaccination, yeah, uh, yeah, and you again compare Eastern Europe to Western Europe, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia here, the Netherlands, UK, France, and on the other end. In Estonia, almost nobody is immunized. I mean, this is here 2% or 2.2% against influenza, whereas if you look at the other end, Netherlands, 80% of population is immunized. Again, it's a very different approach. I mean, the, the, the things here that uh, you do research-wise in Netherlands quite don't apply to Estonia and then other way around. So, so Europe is not the uh, one common and, and not everything can be directly extrapolated um, from one country to the other. So now, uh, this is uh, just a map to show where the European research is conducted, and this is a number of projects. And you will very clearly see what are those countries where most European FP7 projects were happening, and that's from FP7 website. So these are mainly Italy, especially Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, some, uh, something happening in, uh, also in, in southern part of UK. But again, here is the Eastern Europe, very few dots. Uh, it's like immunized. These are like immunized against varicella, and these are non-immunized. So that's how you would, we, we would see in, in, in the, the infectious diseases uh, terms. Uh, and I appreciate that this sort of intermittent, these are also heavily populated countries. There is a population wise, they are also more populated, but I, I think that there is a something else into it. And, and this, this is exactly the same where the money is. The money is, the, the or European research money also goes to, the, to those countries where there are more projects. And, and looking at the sort of Eastern European on three Baltic countries, the dots are very small. So the very sort of in, in, in general, very, uh, still very little money goes to the, goes to the Eastern Europe, even, even in larger Eastern European countries, there, don't, there are not that many dots. So how about local funding? If we look at them, this, this slide is in Estonian, but I apologize, but I just want to draw your attention to this dark blue and, uh, and uh, red and these green colors. This is the money for Estonian re research that comes from Estonia, from Estonian government. 
all other colors are actually European funds. So the, the, in general, also our own governments don't want to, uh, to give money to the research and we just had the election and, and then the word research did not exist anywhere. There are all, all completely different topics that are in the agenda of politicians and this message needs to, doesn't get very well through. And the, when I looked at the program Argo just presented, uh, these are, this, this is just Estonian projects and these are health projects. Only 7% of Estonian money goes to the projects that are related to infectious diseases. So, so in, total, uh, in total amount over five years, 1.7 million euros, it's, it's not that much money that Estonia puts on the, on the infectious diseases. But funding is associated with outcome. This is not from Estonia, this is from UK. And you can <coughs> clearly see the X or Y axis, it's the um, amount of money that has put, uh, been put on the research. And the, on the uh, X axis, there are tallies or disability adjusted life years. And you can see the more money you put, the better is the disability adjusted or the, the the, the longer people live without uh, disability. And this is exactly the same 2004 and 2008. And these are only projects that uh, involve infectious diseases. So if you put more money, you bring benefit to, to your own population or the, to the population of the world. But money is not everything. Again, looking at this slide, this slide is a, maybe slightly outdated. But this slide actually presents you uh, the uh, number of population <coughs> multiplied by impact factor per million of population divided by GCP. So these are sort of objective data. And, and looking here, the US is still on the top of yeah, And this, this is a project on infectious diseases only. Cross national product, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, the, the US is still in the top. Eastern Europe is better than Japan, uh, but not much better than Japan. But the sort of positive thing is that the numbers are going up, but still the gap between Eastern Europe and US, or even between Eastern and Western Europe is quite high. So it's, it's not only money. There is something else that is happening in Eastern Europe that uh, in, uh, sort of, uh, in terms of publication, it's far behind uh, from Western Europe or let alone from, from US. This is uh, one more recent study uh, conducted in the Institute of uh, Public Health uh, by Professor Anneli Uskula. Who, and, and she was, or her group was looking <coughs> on the, on the um, publication rates on HIV in, in different countries, and, and this was divided by million of population. And again, HIV, well known, very prevalent in Eastern Europe. But you can see that uh, in upper part are Western European countries, and in lower part, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, European countries. Even in, in sort of uh, areas where Eastern Europe is, uh, is, is a very prevalent, it's still the publication rate is relatively low. And pretty much the same picture here. Here she was looking at the high impact journals versus low impact journals. Again, Western Europe in upper part and Eastern Europe in lower part of the, of the, of the graph. So, Something needs to be done. So what can be, what, what issues can be, uh, or what needs to be resolved in, in Eastern, Eastern European uh, countries, or I um, don't know, obviously, all Eastern European countries, but I can talk about my own country. It's a promoting evidence-based medicine. It's a, it's a huge part of our, our work. It's still, uh, not very popular to, to talk about evidence-based medicine. 
the teaching of research methodology needs to come to the medical school or the, to the university rather than 10 years after, after graduation. And we are actually now implementing in our university the so-called so research path, where we allowed students interested in basic research to take one year of from the medical studies to research and get PhD degree earlier than they would do otherwise. Um, the, it's still, uh, still is the problem is the, uh, the sort of, uh, physicians are very busy in their everyday clinical work and they can't do science in between five or seven or, or seven and nine in the evening. So we are still fighting that the com combined position physician <coughs> plus scientist would be created. This is obviously a money issue and until the physician salary is twice as high as a scientist salary, this issue will not be resolved. And Argo said that unfortunately nobody is uh, uh, coordinating any pro uh, project. Yes, we would like to coordinate, but we currently lack uh, supportive service services. European grant is not being run or written in the, on the top of your clinical and, and, uh, and teaching uh, responsibilities. You need some, some support uh, from, from, uh, from other other areas and the uh, the increased need for clinical research is also very important. So now I just wanted to finish my talk by bringing a couple of examples where where Eastern Europe or where we have been very active. The one is the the one project we discussed in the morning, the off-patent drugs. This has been one uh, a successful project, or you know, it's not 100% successful, but but we didn't, uh, we didn't manage to do everything we aimed to do, but at least we finished the clinical trial. And this was a, a Neomero project, which was an open label randomized controlled trial comparing meropenem to predefined standard of care. It was running in five European countries plus Turkey, and the project is now finished, and sort of uh, we are desperately waiting data to come out in a in, in couple of weeks' time. Um, and the study, as I said, already was running in, in different European countries, and you can see that two Eastern European countries, Estonia and Latvia, participated. And this is probably one slide which, uh, which makes me very proud of Estonia. This is forecasted number of patients, and this the dark blue is actually recruited number of patients. And you can clearly see that sort of some that, that you know Estonian sites were very good. I mean they 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 and, and these were these were very experienced sites. They, those sites had done their research before and are mm -hmm. currently doing. Whereas in some other countries sort of the forecasting didn't go that well. So they forecasted to take uh, uh, many patients, but they manage to take <coughs> much less patients, which is obviously, for those who have run clinical trials, they know that this is the worst nightmare you could have. If you would say that I can uh, give you one patient and you take this one, that's better than if you say that I will uh, c contribute 100 patients and you end up contributing 10, so because then it's already too late to go somewhere else and do something else. And the other project we have been also, and this project has been already mentioned, it started on the name of Cascade and then it continued on the name Eurocord. It's an HIV, uh, HIV uh, project related to HIV and the one name uh, which we contributed was to, we created the database of HIV positive patients. And, and this is especially um, could be done in small countries like Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania because in our countries people don't disappear. We know, you know, we know who is who, so, so people know each other. Also the Eastern European and this is Estonia especially is heavily computerized country. I mean, no, we don't have any household without computer. We have households with several 
computer. So and uh, and the sort of the IT is uh, is very 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 popular, and and you know everything nowadays is electronic. So these electronic databases, what the sort of what, what our patients are complaining that nurses are all the time on computer and uh, you go to the doctors, they don't talk to you, they are all the time doing something in computer. So they're putting the patient data on the, on the inter or, or health record. So this electronic health data could be actually excellent to use for the long-term medical research where we certainly lack the data. And this is, this is just an example to show you what, what can be done. We we can sort of compare the CD4 counts at the beginning of uh, uh, the, the treatment or when patients come to the care. So, few conclusions. So, what are the problems of Eastern Europe? And, and these, are, these are just my opinions. I don't, I don't have double blind randomized trials behind it. So it seems that perception of poorly functioning Soviet Union disappear slowly. So people still come to Estonia and they are very surprised. Oh, this is highly developed country. Yes, what did you think that the polar bears are walking on the street? So, so this, this still exists, still us and you. Western Europe and new Eastern European countries. It's difficult to integrate your well-established system. And that's we have seen very well those coming from former Soviet Union. And supporting research supporting systems don't exist. I mean, the, everything is sort of loaded to practicing physicians. And they don't cope. They don't cope with the clinic, night shift, re research. And, and that's, uh, that's where we, we certainly need more sort of supporting stuff in order to be more successful. And this brings to the lack of training. And as I already said, the research, funding of research is not priority of the government. And I think that this is not unique to Eastern Europe. That's probably everywhere. So what, what is the positive of doing clinical research in, in Eastern Europe? Most Eastern European countries, sorry for Poland, uh, Poland is not a small country, I don't think, but most sort of Baltic countries are relatively, uh, relatively small. Uh, they are well organized, they have well organized medical systems. The patients do not disappear. I mean, we can easily sort of do sort of long term research. We would ask neighbors, oh, where is he? Oh, he went there. Okay, we know you can easily get patients. Uh, get, get, get patients back, this is not the problem. Most countries still have sufficient number of doctors, although the immigration is becoming a problem. Motivation and enthusiasm is still there. I mean, we saw that in, in we have seen that in our EPI 7 projects very well that our people still are sort of fairly motivated uh, also to do something not because of money. And the, the sort of belief, at least in some people, is there that, that research leads to economical benefits. Not among governmental leaders, but, but some people still believe. And then, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really, motivation and enthusiasm is still there. If we are looking on your presentation, the title was quite provocative, but the tone also was provocative. Thank you very much, because you, you got very interesting questions. And if we are running our conference under the Latvian presidency, uh, as the Latvian presidency event, probably it's time to, to, uh, to, to discuss such question. And probably it, it will be nice to be Latvian presidency question. And thank you for both about this question regarding uh, East European coordinator and your provocative, but very nice. And, uh, and everybody now have recognized a lot of issues. Uh, short time for questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for a really fascinating talk with many fascinating statistics. Really great and, and lots of food for thought. I could speak for a long time, but I will give myself to much four short remarks or questions. And the first one, maybe just a grain of salt into your point, of course I agree with you, we cannot extrapolate everything, but still, differences in epidemiology, 
doesn't mean that the vaccine that works for one patient is not going to work in Estonia too. So there is a lot of research that could be done um, anywhere and is still applicable to everybody, but I'm sure we agree on that. Um, I think I, I need to make this one point to take a little bit of um, guilt of the EU for revealing statistics to me was really the one where you showed the national investment in research. Now, obviously, I mean, that is not the, the task of the EU framework program is not to compensate for the lack of national investment. Um, so there, our hands are, I mean, what we can do is limited. I think if you correlate the EU funding to the national investment in, in health research, you may, might even be on the top of the, uh, of the statistics. So that, I think, is very interesting. Um, third, a short point on the coordination. I agree that, of course, we would also very much wish more coordinators from Eastern Europe. But I do want to make the point that, and this might be the conditions that I'm going to say, might apply in certain cases, but that this is really, as the projects get bigger and more complicated and more diverse, this is an extremely difficult task for which I think, you do, as you pointed out, you need resources, you need experience also yourself in the EU project, which probably many people in Eastern Europe have through their participation, and you need a very strong standing in the research community in your consortium, because otherwise you can never make difficult decisions. It also requires, of course, involvement and participation in democracy, but there's also a certain level of authority and of decision-making competence that is really required. And the last point to just underlie completely what you said, I love this statistics about forecast versus recruited. Um, as I said, we're very interested in funding clinical trials, and I think that those kind of statistics should actually be made public to people who recruit partners for clinical trials. We are confronted with so many projects, I would say 90% of our projects are delayed because of recruitment. And at some point, we just lack understanding for this. I mean, we're giving money to professionals. Now, everybody knows that things can occur that weren't planned. But if you are a professional clinical trialist, then to some extent you know that things occur that aren't planned, and you should account for this. And it, just also a word of warning to everybody here, that it is already getting increasingly difficult for us to extend projects for a number of reasons. And we still do this at the moment uh, to some extent, but we might not be able to, and at that point, we might have to say at an early time point, stop, if you don't recruit, you're not going to achieve what you promised in five years, so we stop the project now. We have started to do this in one or two cases, and I think we might do it, so really, realistic planning from the outset is essential. And we also have had cases where evaluators were not pleased and simply say, oh, they're going to do so much, this is wonderful, but we rather frequently get the comment now, this is completely unrealistic, so we're going to score this down. They don't make it a realistic plan. Thank you very much. These were, these were very good, good comments. I mean, coming, coming back to, to your comment on, uh, on and I, I agree that the European Union has put so much money on the research, but it's the, somebody already mentioned that a lot of this money goes to the concrete or to the, how we call the, the, the building companies. I mean, they profited a lot because of one building after the other, heavily equipped. But what has not happening thus far is that you need to put also some money to humans. And, and the, the sort of, uh, I, I think that this has expressed in Estonia several times, that if we don't pay to our researchers sort of reasonable uh, salaries or comparable salaries. As I said, that the researchers get uh, half the mm, salary of the doctors. So, so then people will not come back from the from the from the sort of wherever they are training, and and we need those people, you know, who have ties and who like to live in in these cold uh, northern European countries. That, that, that they would come back. So, so I think that the, 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 it's, it was all great that the sort of infrastructure is absolutely superb, or even higher. But uh, but we, we need to invest now for uh, sort of uh, human beings. So so those are and and sort of your comment on recruitment is uh, this this is presented sort of on Thursday on the international meeting the same slide. Oh, so <laughs> you don't name the centers. Uh, we, we have the, uh, we have the, yeah. we didn't want to sort of name and shame or we sort of know who, who they are, but, but, but we, the message is that the planning is the key. So, 
so, okay. so now I have a power to move that interesting discussion to the next room where we have coffee break because we need technical break to download presentation. In 10, 15 minutes, I will be waiting for you back and we will start with the last part of Yeah, because at 4, th someone has already bus to the airport. Thank you very much. Short discussion in the coffee room. And let's come back and... And please download your presentations, next speakers. We will have an, after this presentation a small break. Who will let us? Okay. Okay. So, uh, dear colleagues, dear, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation in this interesting conference. And uh, in 2013, Lithuania has the same position in Europe and a union as now Latvia. We also had a conference, but it was related to the bioethical questions. And now, uh, when I uh, received this kind invitation to, to come here, so I thought that uh, my presentation is out of the scope, out of the scope of infection. But uh, during these discussions, I see that presentation is in line with uh, Professor Kowalski, which is also working in the field of healthy aging, as well as uh, with these discussions about research quality in uh, new European U Union members. So uh, we, I would like to, uh, to show what is happening in Lithuania with the research excellence. Uh, it is well known that uh, research excellence is uh, the main driving force. And uh, to achieve this is necessary and infrastructure and, uh, and researchers. And, uh, and it is, as it was discussed in the morning and, uh, and to today, that there is a big discrepancy between uh, research uh, possibilities in in a new uh, new European Union members as well in comparison to all the members. So to to uh, solve this challenge was launched uh, this teaming project by European Union by, by European Commission in Arise 2020 as well as there is uh, not only teaming projects as well as twinning projects era chair and so what are expectations so we decided in Lithuania to unite the efforts of three our best universities to solve this issue as healthy aging. And uh, because I will not speak about uh, aging, about importance of the problems related to aging po population, Professor Kowalski very nicely demonstrated that this is the same problem in Poland, in Latvia, and in 2030 in Lithuania it will be one third of population more than 65 years old. So, of course, it is such uh, indeed challenge for, for society. So, what is input of these three universities? The first is Lithuanian University of Health Sciences. The main principle of, of activity of my university, I am from this university, is unity of studies, research and health care. And as previously, Estonian colleague draw attention to the need of the research uh, to attract clinicians to research. So we can see that uh, this is realized in our university hospital. And uh, our university is the specialized health education institution with 7,000 students, more than 250 PhD students. And uh, we also w working together with our university hospital, which is largest uh, multidisciplinary healthcare institution in Lithuania. There are more than 2,400 beds. Of course, uh, it is important not the number of beds, but the quality of healthcare service. And uh, our university uh, consists of two academies because uh, we uh, we are have roots 
In uh, Kaunas uh, Medical University, I think colleagues more know Kaunas Medical University, but we in 2010 matched together with Lithuanian Veterinary Academy and we changed our name to the Lithuanian University of Health Sciences. So we have two academies, Medical Academy and Veterinary Academy. So if to look to our research areas, these dealing with biomedical research, we are covering uh, almost all fields of medicine. And uh, we are solving all these problems in three levels, in basic, fundamental level, as functioning mecha mechanism of living tissues. In clinical, we are doing and clinical research and public health. So we can say that uh, we can do research from the molecular level to, to via clinical research to populational level. Now, what is uh, uh, important? I would like to draw attention to this uh, slide, uh, which shows the visibility of our growing visibility of the, our research. Uh, please pay attention that, uh, that there is, this is presented citations of our publications. In 2008, when we initiated European Structural Fund's uh, support to research, our research, I think, was good, but not international level. And during these years, you see that uh, visibility of publications increased uh, very much. And this uh, orientation to toward not to the quantity, but to the quality of publication is maintained all the time. Now, uh, how look uh, uh, this year, our Lithuanian research has this external evaluation. I, I know that Latvia survived this last year. And uh, we are happy that uh, in our university, uh, 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 such, uh, such in uh, institutes as Institute of Neuroscience, as Institute of Cardiology, as well as Faculty of Medicine uh, were, uh, were evaluated as international level institutions. There are, in Lithuania, there were no global leaders, so it was the best evaluation that it is internationally recognized institution. And I think that this helped us that during this first programming period, was paid attention to the research infrastructure and development of researchers. Now, another is how a new, new facility is Advanced Pharmaceutical and Health Technology Center. There is now located our pharmacy faculty as well as laboratories for fundamental research. Now, other participant of our team is Kaunas University of Technology. Uh, this uh, University of Technology is um, well known by technology development and tra transfer. It has more than 10,000 students, nine, nine faculties and research institutes. These research areas covering uh, by Kaunas University of Technology, uh, you see they are technology related and I want to say that our University and University Hospital are working in close collaboration with this technology university and it helps uh, to, to develop some technologies for clinical use. And now the uh, Kaunas Technology University is one of the strongest participants of uh, framework programs. This is in the seventh framework. Uh, they had uh, more than 100 uh, projects, and but we also have the same problem as Estonia. In most cases, we are only participants, but not coordinators. But I think that it, with, with time, it might change. Also, uh, this uh, Kaunas Technology University was uh, nominated as Center of Excellence in <coughs> Organic Semiconductor Research, and. Um, it also shows the excellence of the university. Another feature that this is not only development of technologies, but also 
so, uh, innovations and uh, initiation of startup business. So, in, in summary, we can see that our university is providing as a uh, clinical part of, of the team or public health and technology university is related uh, to the development of technologies and, uh, uh, and innovations. And also, uh, technology university now also opened a new, a new center of innovation and entrepreneurship and they, they are active in this field. The third player of our team is Vilnius University. Vilnius University, of course, it is not only known that it is big and old, but also they are very well known by Institute of Biotechnology. So Institute of Biotechnology is, uh, was as, a, how to say, mother of fermenters, and now you know this was uh, fermenters, and now it is Thermo Fisher Scientific. It was sold to Thermo Fisher Scientific. And uh, now, uh, in our team, this Institute of Biotechnology is covering this fundamental molecular biology research. And of course, this uh, fundamental research is uh, also ha will have uh, and some in the future and uh, clinical impact. Now, our, this team is very well fit to the SMART specialization, what, what was approved in Lithuania. One of the branches is health technologies <coughs> and biotechnology. So there is molecular technologies for medicine and biopharmacy, advanced technologies for personal and public health, and uh, advanced engineering solutions for early diagnostics and treatments. Now, of course, uh, in the teaming project, it is, uh, is necessary to have uh, these uh, uh, partners, which uh, from the, how to say, with excellent research. So our partners are Lund University. We are collaborating uh, in biotechnology, biomedical engineering and medicine and VTT Finland, which are very well known by innovations and and te technology development. So our, uh, so our, we think that the, uh, uh, this health tech center of excellence will, uh, will integrate and support research excellence and innovation development and it will be oriented to healthy aging as the biggest challenge of our society. And uh, we we dream, you know this word, I, have, I had a dream. So we dream that this, uh, this will indeed will be become center of excellence in a healthy aging across the European Union. So what research topics are oriented in, in this um, our research excellence? So it is a mechanism of age-related diseases, biomarkers of uh, age-related diseases, diagnostics and monitoring, and uh, regenerative technologies for age-related diseases. Of course, it is only these main <coughs> directions, but also we looked to the situation in our Lithuanian population according to epidemiological data, and there which are main problems uh, in addition to the neurogeneration diseases, which are very important. So locomotor dysfunction, the, the biggest one, uh, almost one third of the age persons, so <coughs> aged than 65, they have problems with locomotor, locomotor dysfunction, vision problems, cardiovascular diseases, also uh, with stomach and intestine problems. And now, we, uh, in which stage we are? Our project uh, won the first uh, step of, of finding of, by European Commission. Uh, I, as I know that from Latvia also one <coughs> center won, from Estonia two centers, and, uh, but they are not related to medicine. And now, of course, it is, it, we, are, we will have a very busy year to prepare this business plan for the development of for strategy for long-term research and innovation strategy. So, as after one year, it will be necessary to to present to 
to competition our uh, business plan. So at the end, of course it is such also this picture, I think that with the help of technologies even unbelievable things are becoming believable and real. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, So technical break because the bus for three participants of our conference is waiting. Uh, we wish, we thank you for active participation and wish a safe flight home. Okay, come back. And another representative from the Lithuania, Gitana Androlai Tiete. Is it correct? Okay. Computer tired. <laughs> and which is yours? This one. Mm -hmm. Which one is yours? Yeah. So advanced technologies. So technology is killing us. So. <laughs> Good presenter can do without presentation. <laughs> yeah. Your presentation is this one. No. Yeah. No. 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 So. So. It's pretty. From Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like a representation to motivate it. Hello once again. I'm Gitana Andrulitita and I'm working with uh, Professor Solis Chaplinskas in the Center for Communicable Diseases and AIDS in Lithuania. So he didn't have the possibility to come here, so now I will represent you some research in epidemiological and biobehavioral surveillance of target populations which we participated in. So, uh, European Union support of research of a broad variety of topics regarding communicable diseases and enabling multifunctional collaborative projects. So we participated in several projects and uh, First was expanding network for comprehensive and coordinated action on HIV AIDS prevention among IDUs and Bridget populations. So it was NCAP. Uh, second, European MSM Internet Survey, MS. Uh, third, capacity building and combining targeted prevention with meaningful HIV surveillance among MSM. This is CELON and strengthening for communicable disease control system in Lithuania. Uh, what are surveillance of target <coughs> populations? Uh, <coughs> certain groups of people particularly affected, and these include people who inject drugs and men who have sex with men. Its related policies and programs are sometimes contained by the lack of accurate information about full scale of the epidemic. So this is for a number of reasons, including limitations, of existing surveillance and intense stigma associated with disease which makes individuals 
reluctant to seek testing if they believe they may be at risk for HIV. So first uh, and cap and the main and methods. So uh, aim <coughs> was to estimate the prevalence of risk behavior related to HIV infection among IDUs in the capitals of three Baltic countries. It was Riga, Tallinn and Vilnius. So the uh, cross-sectional anonymous surveys of current IDUs was using principles of doing sample. So IDUs were required for non-treatment settings, which is during exchange programs. And what was the pr procedures? Uh, there was an interviewer administrated risk behavior survey, and uh, it con contains uh, the, uh, the covering demographic drug uses history, injected practices, sexual behavior, and another questions. Uh, there was a venous blood sample collection for testing for HAV, HBV, HCV, and other infections. And what are the results of this, this study? Um, there are 86% of IDUs in Vilnius uh, who were injected drugs uh, for six years and longer, and 76% uh, of these uh, were injecting drug daily in the last four weeks. So, um, two percent of them were sharing syringes and needles in the last four weeks, and uh, also two percent were sharing needles with their sexual partners in the last six months. So about 30% uh, of respondents were injecting drug in prison. What is, was the sexual behavior among those respondents? We see that 11% uh, of respondents used condom with primary sex partners and also 11% were using condom with casual sex partners. And, uh, 5% uh, uh, said that they have uh, sex life, sex work and lifetime, so it's quite much. Um, almost all participants uh, used seating exchange program in lifetime. And what are the prevalence of infections among those people? There are results that um, HIV positive people were about 8%, 82% <coughs> uh, of people uh, had hepatitis B and uh, quite a lot of uh, IDUs were infected with the uh, HCV virus and uh, all three infections were common on uh, 6.8 participants. Uh, in Vilnius, 7% of respondents were positive for syphilis markers. Uh, in Riga, 4%. In Thailand, 8. Sorry, 9%. And interferon G test result was positive for about 25% of respondents. And conclusions for NCAP was that the prevalence of HIV among IDUs in these study samples was high and injected drug use and sexual risk behaviors were common. European MSN Internet Survey, it is the largest transnational survey among MSN ever conducted in terms of number of participants. There are uh, 180,000 MSN from all over the Europe who were enrolled in the study and in Lithuania there was 595 MSM, and uh, we see that uh, uh, support joint project was uh, of uh, 35 European countries, including academic, governmental, and non governmental organizations. Uh, this survey was um, the, in 25 different language vers versions. 
So the objective was to access futures, features of sexual behavior and needs for STI prevention among MSM. And uh, the results showed that uh, approximately 35% of all respondents said where HIV had HIV test in the last 12 mon months uh, and the least in Lithuania only about 20%. Uh, the same question just uh, about STDs. Uh, the high number more than 40% was in Netherlands, UK, Russia, Belarus, Belgium, France, Ireland and Sweden. In Lithuania, 17% of IUs had tested uh, for STIs in the last 12 months. What is the knowledge on HIV infection in Lithuania and all, in all participants? At average, 93% were generally aware on HIV infections and laboratory testing. Uh, about 93% uh, in Lithuania knew that HIV is caused by uh, AIDS is caused by HIV, and uh, about 98% knew that HIV infection could be confirmed or rejected by laboratory tests. Almost 94% knew that AIDS is still not curable, and uh, about 90% knew that HIV infection could be confirmed by medical tests only in several weeks after infection. And knowledge varies in different countries, the best informed MSM in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Um, we asked uh, participants what are, is their status about HIV and uh, uh, HIV positive were less than 2% in Bosnia, Slovakia, Cyprus, Bulgaria, Turkey, Malta, Estonia and Belarus. In Lithuania about 12% uh, said that they are HIV positive. And uh, those, these numbers um, may not show the real situation because uh, some were not tested. Furthermore, uh, MSM motivation to answer the questions deferred this may be attributable to all the MSM each and consequently higher incidence in some countries. And curiously, the number of HIV positive respondents in some countries was higher than officially stated. So primary survey results proved risky MSM behavior and need of continuous HIV SCI promotion programs. So we know that MSM and Lithuania are still marginal, marginalized and usually avoid the outing. And this is why they take the highest risk to get HIV. And uh, we are far behind uh, by the healthcare habits because 20% of all MSM in Lithuania got tested on HIV in the last 12, 12 months and only 17 on STI to compare with the uh, Europe average there was 35 and 40 respectively. Another project Salon, it is project initiated, developed uh, com and implemented combined HIV surveillance and prevention activities tar targeting MSM and uh, the pro uh, programs were implemented in 13 European countries. We see all the countries which participated. And uh, the ob objective to was to develop capacity building on HIV STI surveillance among MSM and via behavioral service using different sample methodologies. Um, we see that respondent driven sample sampling was in Verona, Vilnius, Bratislava and Bucharest and it was a variant of chain referral sampling specifically designed to uh, sample how to reach populations, uh, uses coupons for identifying participants and linking who recruited whom, it uses an incentive system 
uh, in order to guarantee participation it is initiated by purposely selected members of target populations um, and uh, uh, blood samples were taken and uh, data on prevention needs and behaviors has been collected through anonymous questionnaire linked to the biological samples. The results showed that uh, almost uh, 5,000 MSM were en enrolled and uh, more than 4,000 tested for HIV and moreover among those enrolled through FDS, uh, 1,305 were also tested for syphilis, HBV and HCV. And uh, the highest percentage of MSM reach with HIV prevention programs, uh, the highest proportions were seen in Sofia and Hamburg with more than 80% uh, reach through HIV prevention programs and the lowest levels reached through HIV prevention programs were seen in Bratislava and Warsaw, which is less than 30%. Uh, estimates the percentage of MSM who received an HIV test in 12 months and know their results ranged from 37% in Bratislava and to uh, 74% in Sofia. Um, in terms of prevalence, with that uh, HIV prevent prevalence range from 10 to 20 percent in five cities, and um, we see that in Vilnius, HIV prevalence was estimated below 5 percent, and in all cities, HIV prevalence was higher among men aged um, more than uh, 25 years old compared to the younger people. And uh, we see the positive results of HBS antigen positive uh, were from 2.2 in Bratislava to 6.8 in Bucharest. And we see that uh, anti HCV uh, positive ranged from uh, 0 0.9 in Vilnius to 22.8 in Bucharest. And yeah, because there is some place. Uh, so the last project was uh, it is a strengthening of communicable disease control system in Lithuania. The aim is to strengthen control in communicable diseases in Lithuania by creation of uh, new subsystems of communicable disease surveillance. And uh, targeted groups are healthcare and other specialists, and we see task that is expansion of national informational system of communicable disease and their agents, improvement of population skills to counter CD spreads related threats, implement of healthcare and other specialist skills and improvement of legal framework of regulation on communicable disease control. Uh, the project realization will contribute to implementation of the European Union health strategy and its action plan. And uh, it, we see the results that it has created influenza and HIV AIDS surveillance <coughs> subsystem and uh, it is launched. So uh, more than 100 <coughs> specialists working or uh, work with new subsystems are trained and uh, we see that uh, methodological recommendations by seven uh, communicable diseases group was prepared as uh, communicable diseases action logarithms developed 10 algorithms on disinfection improved legal acts prepared and almost 200 2742 specialists were trained as a result, the surveys which are presented in the population. So, thank you for attention. Thank you. Yeah.
doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, now the Latvian team, the presidency team, were leading the last part of the presentation. The Andolis Bert, uh, Bertis Health National Contact Point. Mm -hmm. He is not only a specialist in computers, but also a very good presenter and contact person. Okay. Okay. So, I have a really short presentation here. Okay, moment. So, this is this. Oh. A uh, very short presentation about uh, our, uh, how to say, success or uh, history in uh, framework programs and the place of infectious diseases research on the Latvian health research landscape. So, I will also start here with a short history. Here in Latvia we are happy to have in the biggest city in the region and actually already in 1913 it was a pretty big city and uh, it was uh, faced with a problem how to deal with infectious diseases. Because the social topography, and if you go from here, from the center to this direction, you will see really social topography problems, how to insulate, for instance, the uh, diseased persons which have suspected infectious diseases. Uh, the system of Leprosoria, which was developed in Latvia, was highly prized by Virchow during his visits to Imperial Russia, and actually the last Leprosorium was decommissioned in uh, 2010, which was the only one remaining in this old, uh, very big region. In the interwar period, the biggest challenge was tuberculosis, of course, like everywhere in the world. Latvia had, in fact, a lot of own production, for the serum products, for instance, but also small pharmaceutical industry. In 70s, 80s, we had regarding the infectious diseases here <coughs> some kind of specialization, and the specialization is earmarked by intensified nitrofurans research, which was uh, taking place at Institute of Organic Synthesis. And in 1972, the uh, ph uh, pharmaceutical company Online Pharma established exactly which started with synthesis of nitrofurans in this region. In this time, there was specialization in the Eastern Bloc. For instance, the oxyhinolins were produced in Hungary. We produced the nitrofurans. And actually, it is ongoing also today. There is even modernization product for that because for antimicrobials we have not only efficiency or susceptibility problem, but also the problem of cost. And nitrofurans are exceptionally cost efficient. Here are, in fact, our three leading research institutes, which were, in fact, all originating from the Academy of Sciences. The first one is Kirchenstein Microbiology and Virology Institute, which is organizing the event today. Institute of Organic Synthesis will make presentation of their activities in the next presentation. And we have also dedicated institute, which is, deals for, which is dealing, for instance, with animal infections, yeah? which are also a kind of concern, especially regarding, for instance, antibiotica, contaminated uh, food, products. Clinical facilities. Latvia has a really large, very well equipped, very advanced infectology center, which is built on the state of former Rigard Leprosorium. <coughs> and this is really a very good facility, well specialized uh, research on infectious diseases possible. Part of this is tuberculosis and lung disease center, which is located even uh, further from the center of Riga, and actually the center had in FP7 two projects and uh, was very successful with this. Uh, structural fund investments. Uh, I will not go here in details about structural fund supported uh, products of research, uh, pro projects in research or, or product development uh, projects, but we have in fact three national research centers which are dealing more or less also with infectious diseases and uh, here they are listed. In fact, they are investments uh, primarily or initially in the infrastructure. Now there is a big discussion um, in Latvia going on, how to upgrade this format of national research centers, how to integrate the infrastructure with humans, and finally with projects which can be accomplished here on this equipment and by special people. 
Our success in Framework Program 5, Framework Program 5 was absolutely marvelous for new member states because we joined it. There was special extension activity and uh, there are smaller projects in fact and also narrowly focused and it was uh, really not so complicated like today to join this program. And uh, there was a special pure action, control of infectious diseases, and here we had 23 proposals, 5 got funded, success rate 22%. Actually, Latvia cannot complain about success rate in all uh, framework programs. The issue is that we had a pretty small number of uh, proposals, yeah? only one third of which Estonia was producing, yeah? and uh, also the grants are small, but uh, this is a bit different problem because uh, wages are smaller and therefore also the grants are smaller. And uh, in the framework program six, well, the big project started, the, the uh, fauna of big projects was uh, instantiated in framework programs. Actually, in uh, the life sciences priority, three of the projects were in uh, infectious diseases of 10 of the total. And a very strong uh, point was the DNA or genomics-based vaccines, which was a paradigm, or we can say also fashion <coughs> of that time, yeah, which is actually maybe not so important today. And uh, Latvia entered also the pathogenomics, the first era yeah, in this era, uh, which was in fact a new instrument, which started in FP6. In FP7, uh, infectious diseases was part of major diseases uh, partition in framework program 7. And uh, there was, in fact, uh, sub-focus emerging epidemics, poverty-related diseases, and also vaccines research was continued. And uh, Latvia has joined also the Aeronet Hivera, but not at the beginning, but in fact, only for the third call, where we were, in fact, pretty successful. And this is the very strange or very bias of our results in FP7, because you see here, the biggest chunk here is uh, the IMI project, which will be presented by the next presenter, and therefore that it is a very high funding for this, yeah? It makes already bias of this all partition. Then we have one IMR project financed from FP7 in innovation, yeah? to this topic, other infectious diseases and other diseases. So uh, cardiovascular and cancer, and we had no projects in, uh, for instance, in neurosciences, this all makes only 10%, yeah? So IMR has been absolutely a hotspot for Latvia, yeah, during FP7. Uh, capacity development, this is also a very important thing, and actually we were successful in the last call, well, the bigger number of the record projects are funded. One of them, which is in fact supporting this event, is dedicated exactly to infectious diseases. The second one, which will be presented by colleagues, is partially focusing also on development of antibacterial medicines. Yeah? So, development of capacity. Aeronets, as I said, we participated in Hivera, but not at the beginning, but we were successful in one call, we are participating in, the, in two projects. We hope this will be continued also in Horizon program. EDCTP2. Latvia is a strange case, because we joined EDCTP as observer in 2010, and we have also observers for EDCTP2. The problem with new member states is that we don't have natural collaboration with sub-Saharan Africa. Because the regions we are collaborating in so named uh, um, development um, uh, funding is not sub-Saharan Africa, it is Central Asia. And Central Asia is not supported by EDCTP2 program. However, formally, the projects in EDCTP2 can be co-funded also by Latvian National Programme to the extent of 50% if there will be our successful participants in this EDCTP2 programme. Yeah? Unfortunately, at the moment, as far as I know, none of the new member states is participating in this programme, which can be, of course, very important due to clinical emphasis. Now, what is going on in uh, Horizon 2020, 
so we have one initial training network exactly in this area. Um, for research projects, actually only one poll is evaluated, has been evaluated at the moment. The evaluation is very, very long. We didn't have any proposals on infectious diseases because in the Horizon program there is not any more kind of dedicated topics for infectious diseases except for vaccine development. And there are broad topics about uh, mechanisms of the disease and uh, this is of course uh, very different from framework program 7. And it is still not clear if it is so really optimal. So we have joined this uh, co-fund on antimicrobial resistance. We hope this will be a good beginning because at the moment we are not participating in any joint programming initiatives so that we will on this basis build our participation and of course, as already mentioned, teaming, twinning and other chairs can be also devoted to special topics and actually this is already going on. So we will wait just for the results of the evaluation. So this is my very short presentation. Thank you. So you noticed, I noticed already we have announced his colleague Oswald Pugovic from the Institute of Organic Synthesis and called Spotona. Okay, dear colleagues, thank you for the possibility to, for the opportunity to give this short presentation about our institute, about what we do and what we do in particular in anti-infective research. Uh, I will tell you a few words about our institute, about research, what we are doing, and about two main uh, research projects which are oriented towards the discovery of new uh, anti-infective anti medicines. My presentation will cover research a little bit different from what you heard before. It is early stage research, uh, but Maybe it's good to have also the look to the basis of, of uh, medicinal chemistry. So, our institute. Uh, we are independent public research institute with about 300 employees right now. And this is something like uh, Max Planck Institute system in Germany. But we are here since uh, 1957 when uh, fantastically talented science manager, Professor Hiller, uh, founded the institute uh, as new, uh, let's say, a research center for developing of new small molecules as medicines and pesticides. Now we have about two and a half thousand square meters of uh, laboratory space and our turnover last year was uh, 14 million euros. In the past, we succeeded to discover and develop 18 original molecules and we developed also uh, technologies for about 70 generic medicines. The last uh, original preparation developed at our institute was uh, registered last summer by FDA, it is anti-cancer medicine. And our institution was uh, assessed as leading scientific institution in Latvia and this assessment was done by European uh, experts from Nordic Council of Ministers. What we uh, do here is mainly anti-cancer drugs, cardiovascular medicines or metabolic disorders, CNS active drugs and last not least anti-infective medicines. Uh, all this already addressed our input into uh, furan chemistry, nitrofuran chemistry, which is uh, having a second breeze right now in online farm. But uh, to cover these uh, categories, we uh, work mainly in medicinal chemistry. We, of course, are experts in organic synthesis. 
we do root scouting studies towards generic medicines, and we uh, have research in molecular pharmacology, we have biological screening and analytical support to cover needs of, of this research. But, oh, sorry. Now I think we, had, we had, uh, can skip to uh, these two projects, which are uh, anti-infective projects at IOS. And the one and biggest one is a six-year program, which is uh, funded by Innovative Medicines Initiative. And the goal of this project is to develop novel antibiotics against gram-negative pathogens. So this project has an abbreviation ENABLE. And the second project is Framework 7 project, where we uh, work on new antibacterials. And the evaluation of this project is Nabarsi. I will tell you a little bit more in details about each of these projects. Enable is a unique uh, construction based on public-private partnership. So we have big pharmaceutical companies. In our case, these are uh, Sanofi and GSK, who had their uh, therapeutical targets. We have a huge consortium of 32 partners from 13 countries with a budget <coughs> over 100 million euros. And this is a kind of a black box where we enter with new hits against uh, these targets which belong to the pharmaceutical companies. And we expect that we will come out with drug candidates for clinical trials. Uh, where we are involved, these are two lead to drug candidate programs, and our budget in this case is uh, a little bit more than 8 million euros. Uh, unique, why I say unique, it is unique because uh, we have pharmaceutical companies who give away their therapeutic targets and who want to have expertise uh, research potential, ideas, how to develop new medicines from public area. Probably uh, there could be several reasons why this public-private partnership was needed. Maybe this is uh, a lack of new ideas because pharmaceutical industry is really closed and because of confidentiality reasons maybe not uh, enough networking is there. Maybe there is not enough, uh, let's say, research capacity in different areas. But last not least, I think this is business-driven uh, consortium because anti-infectives is not the uh, most uh, wanted uh, indication for pharmaceutical companies. But there is a, a social need for such medicines and that's why this concept of uh, public-private partnership, this black box, will cover exactly the most risky part of uh, drug development, which is the early stage development. And when we come out with drug candidates, then they can be developed further by uh, companies. So what we are doing there? In fact, uh, the mechanism of action, which is which is uh, which has to be addressed by our group, is uh, inhibition of DNA replication. So, to perform replication, we have to uh, uh, destroy this double strand. This is done by helicases, but when we do so, we have this phenomenon of supercoiling. It is illustrated here. If you do this by hands, yeah? You have these super coils where DNA is practically destroyed. And to prevent this, we have these uh, DNA uh, gerases who uh, uh, prevent DNA from destruction during this super coiling. If we uh, go further, how, how to deal with this super coiling phenomenon? You have these crossing strands of nucleic acids, and to prevent supercoiling you have to put this upper strand below. So you cut the lower strand, 
Then, it, then you have to put together again, and now you have resolved this supercoiling phenomenon. And this is the way how Mother Nature has uh, solved this uh, issue and how uh, replication uh, may take place. So we took, our group took this DNA durase as uh, our therapeutical target. It is uh, not revolutionary now, uh, new, because these uh, enzymes are targets uh, for several drugs. But the idea is that over the, we hope that our molecules will not suffer from uh, uh, resistance phenomenon. Because we have discovered a little bit different uh, binding mechanism of our ligands to this DNA gerase. Currently we have uh, synthesized a little bit more than 120 new molecules which were uh, prospective enough to be tested in microbiological panels. Of, of course, we have very large uh, variation of activities. This panel consists of uh, five different strains, including clinical isolates. And we have the activities from uh, 0.5 nano, uh, make a millimolar to 64 millimolar, which is considered to be yeah, practically non-active. So we have this uh, possibility to study uh, structure activity relationships already in these panels. Not only just binding on this enzyme, but already on activities towards microorganisms. This is what we do in, in, in uh, enable project. The group consists of uh, about 20 chemists. We do also pharmacokinetics, we do toxicology analysis, toxicology assessment, we do met metabolic uh, identifications. That is what, how we assess this uh, huge consortium. Okay, the next project is, of course, smaller. We have one particular enzyme where we dis uh, design inhibitors of this enzyme, against this enzyme. And we hope that we will fight this uh, multidrug resistance phenomena. Project uh, consortium consists of uh, five institutions. Project time is from uh, 2013 to 2016, and the total budget is about 5 million euros. What we do here? We have our group uh, deals with two uh, ways of uh, design of inhibitors. One is so-called rational design. We took simply intermediate of uh, this enzymatic reaction and we make uh, some isosteric substitutions inside this uh, molecule. So what we do, we, we uh, have split this molecule in three parts and for each of these parts we design unnatural but sterically and electronically similar fragments and incorporate them into this molecule. Then we have our colleagues at company Inhibox who do modeling work and as a result of this uh, process we have developed three novel series of inhibitors and we have also uh, filed a patent application together with our colleagues. On the other hand, uh, shortly before this uh, Nabarsi uh, consortium we had structural fund projects which uh, allowed us to upgrade our research infrastructure and we could uh, install fragment based drug design approach at the Institute of Organic Synthesis. So you see this, this is the complete molecule but let's assume that we have fragments of this molecule each of these fragments should have affinity towards our target enzyme. So we screen these uh, fragments, we find the active ones, then we make synthetic analogs of these active fragments, and then we try to uh, have this uh, uh, 3D structure of how these fragments bind to enzymes which we are targeting. This is done by our colleagues at Leeds University, then modeling work again done by...